Well, 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 well. This is a, an interesting stream that we have in store for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another podcast. This is an event. We have had events in the Guild Wars 2 community so magnificent and so epic that we actually had to do a podcast twice earlier on this week with the Barons Club. We've got an impromptu Barons Club podcast with Souls, Enco, MM, and then myself, halfway through there, leaping in at the end to tag team in Souls, who lives on the other side of the planet, so he was very, very tired at that point. But here we go again for round two here with Enko and Guild MM, some of the infamous trading post barons that I'm sure you guys have been hearing a lot about recently. And we've got a lot to talk about today. We're going to kind of give a bit of a recap of the situation and why we're talking about this, like why these things are a very, very hot topic right now. Uh, and then we're actually going to kind of really go for a deep dive into some of the economic aspects of Guild Wars 2 and exactly some of how this stuff works and where gold actually comes from. So uh, in that case, I will go ahead and introduce these wonderful guests here uh then so guild mm right tell us what happened this week in guild wars 2 well the the uh, youtube version you can find on youtube but tldr uh what's been basically happening and predicted since about november the coin wall being an artificial wall and if uh, anyone knew about it being an artificial wall knew that at some point it was going to come down crashing right either through the man himself the mystic coin man or anet when they eventually caught him happened a long time after the wall went up but it eventually did happen and of course the scandalous infusion duping which uh all in all if uh, the man had gotten away with it could have actually broken the game. Could have been the most devastating and probably most legendary thing someone has ever done in an MMO to crash the entire economy into oblivion. And uh, yeah, you can actually go on YouTube. You could watch my video or Teapot's video about it. All the details and that I'll juice. probably cover it here. So you can cover it here as well if you want to recap. But that's, that's it in TLDR fashion. Mm. Uh, okay, awesome stuff. And actually, leading on directly from that, in fact, uh, and I know Enko is going to have some spicy takes on this because I know you're not a big fan of the Mystic Coin. Uh, Enko, could you give us a rundown on what exactly was the Mystic Coin wall? How was it created, and what was it doing? Uh, and you know, you know what, you know what, how did that process actually happen? What was the Mystic Coin buy wall set in place there? Okay, so the Mystic Coin buy wall. Um... There was a 200,000 buy order placed on Mystic Coins at like two gold when they were sitting around like 1.5 gold back in November. Uh, this this happened because of some uh, possible RMT allegations concerning the person in question. And so he got temporarily banned on Overflow and he kind of threw a temper tantrum and went, I'm going to screw everybody over and I'm going to you know, jack the prices of the Mystic Coins up. So you had uh, 200,000 buyers going to two, hundred, at two gold. Um, so that's 400,000 gold worth of buy orders. And at the same time, you had a lot of infusion starting getting instant sold on the trading post. Like people were reporting, hey, I just got my chalk egg sack that's been sitting on there for 10K for like a year and a half. It, it got filled. And like we had a ton of people doing that. So somebody was instant selling these things and just like getting the gold quickly. And it looked like what was happening was that he was turning around and then putting them into buy orders because you can't you can only hold two hundred thousand gold in your wallet at one time honestly yeah, if you had if you had multiple accounts of 200k then you could have done that too but it really did seem like he was just instant selling to get gold yeah and so these two uh events in a way the infusion situation and also the um and also the mystic coins were to a certain extent linked because i i think one of the things that was quite shocking uh, about well you know let's just go there right about cassiano's wealth is that there was actually a lot of liquidity there right there was this ability to actually influence the economy because i believe i would be right in saying that you know like trading post barons don't necessarily have access to a huge amount of actual liquid gold at any given time so someone um you know essentially uh, an individual being able to do this was somewhat unprecedented on this level of scale right this amount of gold being kind of shoved into the economy shoved into mystic coins was somewhat unprecedented do you think that would be a fair thing to say 
Uh, I mean, like, uh, let's just say, okay, let's give it an example of like, let's put up the five richest uh, traders that at least I could know of. Me, Ko, Yender, uh, Cage Old, but he's not very active, but let's just put him in. Uh, and let's just say those four, right? So I'm at like around anywhere from 1.2 to 1.7. Uh, liquid gold that differs of obviously with my spending and whatever I'm doing. Uh, Enco can go anywhere from 100 to, I mean, he could even hit a million if he wanted to, but Enco chooses to invest it in his account. And then you have Yender, who's 500k. SK Jold, uh, he, he's quit, he's retired, but he has probably around a million. Um, oh, this is four of the richest players, at least I know. There's probably others uh, if I missed anyone, whatever. Being able to put up a 500k wall like it you know that's it would take let's just say 100 to 200,000 of each of these traders own wealth to put up every day to eat up the orders because you have to outpace the uh, demand right uh with mystic coins this is very easy to do because there's not that many the coins at least in the in the game supply on that is very low so it's possible with five six people maybe like understand that you're losing that money you're not going to make that money back like that's there's no way for you to profit off putting up buy order walls and then you know, other than maybe screwing with people in the game so basically it works against you like unless you can burn 100 200 000 gold uh, every three four months just like that including whatever you spend anyway it, it's impossible because you can only make anywhere from say a very efficient like trader can make anywhere from 20,000 to 60,000 gold profit a month efficiently assuming they had a very good month right so it's it really can't you can't really manipulate the market in that way uh even if you have five six people it, it eventually like someone's gonna have to give up and say like guys I can't really do this anymore because I'm just burning money and you have to make sure you keep covering the money that you burn otherwise you're then just losing your money right so one person to do it we obviously didn't su suspect there was anything other than RMT. We were like, maybe the money was made from RMT. We didn't know anything until the infusions popped up on the stream two, three weeks ago. And then that kind of you know, hit everybody in the head like, oh, this person's been duplicating all these items all this time. This is why they can afford spending two, three million gold on Mystic Coins and putting up all these, you know, five, 600k walls. Because realistically, it's just not possible, especially when richest players can only get up to a million right now in the game, which is very good for Guild Wars 2, at least, in this stage of the game. Yeah, that's obviously a lot of gold, but as you say, you know, it, it is actually very difficult to have this kind of sustained effect on the economy. It's why you'll often see, you know, someone on Reddit will say, like, oh, look, this item's going up quick, something funny's going on here, but then you'll see it will kind of fizzle out fairly quickly, right? Because you just cannot sustain this level of kind of injection uh, into the economy there uh, for a long time. And actually, like this particular instance there, you know, like the, a lot of this, uh, a lot of the gold was indeed being generated and a lot of the prices of infusions were going down because of them just literally cloning themselves. And I am really, really curious. Like, do you guys, act, do, do you guys think that uh, to a certain extent the damage is done with this because well if we actually look at the numbers here it was what 33 million gold worth of duplicated stuff right that's kind of appeared out of nowhere um like you know how long is it going to take for things to go back to normal because now we're seeing we're seeing stuff like a uh, chalk egg sack for under 10,000 gold is now available. I've been on um, Guilds to Exchange. And I've been seeing some people uh, looking to sell Kanaur for 17,000, where previously it was more like, you know, a 30k, 40k even there. Like, you know, is the damage to a certain extent, um, has it been done? Like with this, with all the kind of dumped uh, items that have been entered the market now? Uh, yes. So yeah. <laughs> the damage to the infusion prices is going to be pretty much permanent unless Enet changes a couple of things. Because um, a lot a lot of the, the deal with markets, um, especially in Guild Wars 2, is perception. So uh, if people are like, oh, infusions are plentiful now, or like just like when they increase the drop rate. And, you know, Costion actually tried to play it off like, oh, the infusions are dropping because, you know, they increase the drop rate for Chalks and Connors. So it, a lot of it is has to do with perception. Like the, we get asked all the times, like, hey, could you guys, you know, manipulate a market? And Guild Wars 2, you honestly normally can't because no matter, you know, as MM was saying, if you if you combined everybody's wealth together and we had, we tried to manipulate a certain market, uh, 
there's usually enough things in game that are generated that you know if we try to put a buy on it, it it gets filled up and then as mm said like we would have to stop so the with mystic coins in particular right now with like you, you actually can go in game right now and look at the buy orders on mystic coins um there are people trying to keep the price at two gold like you can see it in the buy orders um but it's also because there's a perception now that hey mystic coins are worth two gold they're really not they really should be around like a gold 30 gold 40. But because we've had it for like five, five to eight months now where they were over two gold, people just have in their mind like this is the normal price. So they're going to keep trading it like that. Now, likewise, with infusions, you know, for a long time, we had chocks going for 20, 22 K and people just had in their mind. That's what the price should be. That's what they should be at. And it wasn't until we had just a ton of them just get filled and the buyers are gone that now people are like, oh, they're not worth as much. So a lot of it is perception. So if nothing changes in the game then yeah the damage is to us permanent like if like when i say nothing can change the game like if anything does change something like i don't know make make infusions become account bound if you use them like kind of like how mini pets you could display them without without uh binding them but if you actually want to unlock your wardrobe then it it gets consumed if they did something like that so if you want to show off the aura you can but if you want to like use it in your equipment or like unlock it and it goes in the armory hopefully then it actually gets consumed. If they did something like that, the price will go back up because now you are actually having something be consumed out of the market. It's no longer tradable. But yeah, nothing changes. Permanent damage to the infusion market. Wow, that is quite interesting. That's, that's a, a fascinating thing about perception, though, as well, right? and how like the perceived value of things uh, does actually kind of hold on there. That, I mean, that really is a very interesting one indeed. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see, uh, you know, if people actually are able to kind of get over that to an extent, and we see if Mystic Coins will come down there. But you're, you're not a big fan of Mystic Coins, are you, Anko, to, to be precise? Like, can, can you explain why? Like, why do you not like where Mystic Coins are in the economy and in Guild Wars 2? Okay, so Mystic Coins, you know, I, I've always, as you know, I've always been against it as a currency. Like when Dan suggested it as a currency for, uh, for exchange, I was a little like, eh, probably not the greatest, but I mean, I can understand why they want to do it because it's, it's a gold dense item. It's hard to trade in this game off uh, the trading post because the 500 gold cap limit. Um, so when I'm looking for an item to use as currency, I'm looking for something that's generated constantly and something that's been consumed constantly. And also something that people actually see as useful. Because you don't want people just buying this thing to use as a currency. You also want people buying it because they want to use it too. So Mystic Coins, um, you know, they're generated at a very limited rate. Uh, you know, as your recent videos have attested to, you know, you got all you got accounts making up from login rewards. Uh, that's honestly the primary way that Mystic Coins are being generated. Yes, you can get a daily one from the Leyline Anomaly event. You can get one from the Daily Forger, but there's a very limited amount coming into the game. You can't farm them. You can't farm them infinitely like other items can where it's just like the more time you spend, the more of them you could get. So there's a limited amount being produced, but then when you actually turn around and look at what are they used for, they're honestly not used for a lot of stuff. Like they're used to make legendaries because like you have to make Mystic Clovers, Gen 2s require a stack on top of Mystic Clovers. Um, but if you look at outside of legendary production, um, what Mystic Coins are used for, you got some recipes that honestly nobody makes. Like you have some like super expensive skins that like nobody really makes them. And if even if you do, they're making for themselves once, so nobody really sells them. So people are buying Mystic Coins specifically to use for a currency. They're not really using it because, oh, I want to make 20 legendaries, right? So it, it's, and they're just, they're just generated too slowly. So I'm more of a fan of things where it's like, there's a constant production game. The more you play, the more you can get them. And also people want to use them because they're used for a lot of different things. So like, I'm a big fan of Ectos for that because it's every level 60 rare or higher you get ectos every exotic level 68 or higher you can salvage for ectos they're consumed by a lot of people they're they're not as gold dense but they're still a decent it's still like a better option than just like straight up gold but like you know you can salvage them in the t6 dust and luck they're consumed in a lot of different recipes you need them for every upgrade you need them for just a ton of things so it's it's a lot more stable as it it's a lot harder to manipulate because you now as i said people have asked before it's like if you if you guys got together could, could you guys do you guys have enough wealth to manipulate a market if you try to put a 200,000 buy order wall on Ectos, like you just put one at 40, like, uh, at like 40 silver and try to jack the price up, that would be gone in like two days. It would just be cleared out by, by like people producing Ectos. It'd be gone in a couple of days. Like if you want to try to raise the price of Ectos, you would be having to put in like a million buy orders at like 40 silver for like six months. And 
it would be half your buyers would be getting filled every single day because there's, there's there it just gets generated that well in game but you got you notice that the prices aren't dropping on this sequence or on uh ectos even though there's so many because people are still buying just straight up use them you don't have that with mystic coins mystic coins are you're being purchased and then they're just being used as a currency to trade off the tp that's why, most that's only why a legendary like most only they're used as a legendary and this is why like with mcs you could if you had like a you know thousands upon thousands we're talking about three four hundred thousand gold you could technically, yes, raise the price of MCs. And this is why if you're using it as a currency, um, if you're someone who had, you know, has a large stock of them because the, you can trade with them or something and they all of a sudden a buy order comes up and it just fills, right? Those people who have them, it, you know, the account is artificially inflated, right? It's like what I had in, uh, you know, a thousand gold worth of MCs is now a 3000 gold worth of MCs, right? Technically speaking. Um, the people who had traded out their MCs now just lost big money on their trades, right? Because say I traded a weapon for uh, five stacks of MCs. All of a sudden now uh, I could have traded that weapon for only three stacks of MCs, right? Like you, you've lost basically two full stacks because of the price increase. So um, why, like Engo said, like Ectos, any, anything like that can generate and have a use in the game is just impossible. Eventually you're going to have to take down your wall or even maintain a wall, so... Um, the only thing about MCs, I would say, is they're convenient. That's why they were used for trading of mostly infusions, like, and then slowly start happening into weapons and other stuff. Uh, but mostly it was for the infusions because nobody wants to send like oh, 400 yeah. stacks. Oh, let the, yeah, oh, 500 Ectos, gold. Right? Well, yeah, of the actors, all just 500 gold as well. Have fun with that, right? You know. <laughs> <laughs> like you know so, like, be, be mail like, cap for like 10 years right It'll mostly yeah mostly a convenience thing and and it made sense uh but it was tricky because uh and even before the wall i would say uh enko remembers this when the guild wars 2 exchange was very very active this is even before the overflow discord even existed um the, the whole price about infusions being 20k 30k by the way this is all like a imaginary number some person just bought one at 20k and then all of a sudden people were like you know what this is worth 20k it just became that yeah. was the new normal like that, that's that perception how... again that, that, perception. that's a very interesting question i mean obviously you guys are very experienced with this stuff what would you guys say the actual value um in today's money um of a chuck is like you know if, if you could oh. if you could say like you know what is this absolute value if you could even do such a thing what would that the be supply that there is now like and especially what just happened with the whole thing um, they're probably at the price they should be at, like anywhere between 8 to 10k, maybe 12k if there's less supply. But the whole idea that a chalk used to cost 20k, 23k peak, uh, at one point even 25k, uh, confetti being anywhere from 18 or 16k to 20k, this was all somebody decided to pay that price. Someone else saw that, paid that price, and then it became the thing mm. that people would yeah. do for these infusions. There, there, that was their value. There, there is a certain level of correlation, though, to the rarity as well, of course, because, for example, Chak is a very commonly run event. Um, so is Confetti, like the Pinata as well. And obviously, the I suppose, like, the uh, the rarest item in the game, maybe not so much anymore, but, uh, you know, the, the Kanor Infusion, that is one of the kind of less commonly run um events right you know you don't ha you don't see yeah. everyone doing that every day and therefore it is a bit more of a rare item a bit more pricey there as well but uh you know of course now we even see that coming down there perhaps closer to its true value there um uh, as well and you know on this topic actually this is obviously the, the big topic you know as, as you guys have been saying has been market manipulation and you're like oh no these barons how you know being accused of you know meddling in the affairs of the economy um what are there any any other really big examples of uh, a very high value player influencing the economy or is this like a really big standout thing with the mystic coins and of course now the infusions how much do you guys <laughs> actually manipulate the market so with this situation um <laughs> like this honestly happened because Cassiano just didn't handle it very intelligently like if you, if you had access to a dupe um, you shouldn't advertise it. Like, you, you shouldn't be bragging how you have 16 million, like, liquid. So, like, what, what Emin was talking about before, if we had all pulled our wealth together, like, most of my wealth is in my account value. It's all account bound. Because I care more about getting upgrades for my account than, you know, just hoarding wealth for no reason. So it's like, like, but, you know, I, I said this before on other streams, where it's like, I kept very low key with what I did for, like, six and a half years, because as that spreadsheet that I have now shared, 
um, everything on that thing is not profitable because everybody's looking at it. So if Cassiano, if you had somebody else that was smarter doing this, um, we would never have known. You would have like slow fed infusions to the markets, um, like maybe like drop a Connor like once a week or something like that. You know, you would you would not be advertising, especially when we all know that like he was around a million a year prior to all this, and all of a sudden he jumps to like 16, 20 million, and everybody else knows like that's not really feasible. So if he was smarter about this, we would never have known. You would have slow fed the markets, um, the mystic coins, like hey, put in like two thousand buy orders. You could you could slowly build up the perception that they're more valuable. Um, so could have there has there been other market manipulators in the past? There have been attempted market manipulators in the past, like Flame Legion Ruins, for instance. Um, <laughs> those have been getting pushed for like six years. <laughs> Every single time there's a balance pack, they get pushed by six years. And this is like the first that, time that that's like a meta where somebody's like, hey, here, here's like a good build that uses them. And they might sustain value now. But the problem, again, it all comes down to how they're being generated versus how they're being consumed. So Flame Legion Rune, like I had the statistics on like how often uh, a Flame Legion Rune drops in game compared to other runes. And it's 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 above average. So it's higher than the average. And so like you can, this is the same thing we're talking about before. Like you can't jack up the price of uh, Flame Legion rooms to like extraordinary amounts just because they drop in game so much. Like it, it's actually uh, like, if you want to compare these things to like concentration sales or something like that, like, yes, they're under crafting value right now. So there is like a, there is like a price ceiling on this. But if you're trying to hoard these things for value, there's so much being generated in game that you really can't, increase the price on them so much like if you look at in game i think what last time i checked they're only like 30 silver or something like that um so the pat other market manipulations we've seen in the past uh i mean people have attempted mystic coins before uh and it, it immediately got cleared out i saw somebody trying to do this with ectos uh like a year and a half ago somebody tried to raise the price of just 30 silver within two hours it got dumpstered on and went back down to 20 silver so Generally speaking, the Guild Wars 2 economy is actually pretty self-sustaining. It's actually um, a pretty good microcosm for it. Like, uh, John Smith, when he was here, he did a good job in setting up, like, an in-game economy that generally self-corrects itself. Um, it's only when you have an outside force, an external force that's not normal to the economy, to now where we're seeing this. So, have there been market manipulation tips in the past? Yes. Um, did they last more than six hours? No. So that's and why also, yeah, it's like this. you don't make enough to really like if you're manipulating mm. the market in some way, you're actually burning. Like you have to, first of all, have enough gold to burn, keep it going. And then how do you actually make money off of it? If you can't sustain the price where you want it to be, um, you're losing money for nothing. So like there is no purpose to even manipulate the market and um, kind of give an example, because I mean, uh, flame region uh, flame region runes are like one example of where again above average drops is very impossible same with ectos um something similar to mystic coins even maybe less let's just say legendary weapons right um if you were to try to bring legendary weapons up to like a thousand gold let, let's just say from two thousand to three thousand right you want to up the price up a thousand um the statistics if you go on bltc.com each weapon sells, how many weapons sell a day? Like five, 10 of each weapon, right? Uh, let's just say 10 weapons. Oh, uh, you, you are Did muted. You cut out. Yeah, you, you cut out a bit there, Evan. Oh, oh guys, also correction on the Flame Legion runes. Like when I said the last time I checked, they were 30 silver. Um, they're at 10 silver now. <laughs> They yeah. dropped down from 15 down yeah. to 10 silver oh, oh. last night. Welcome back. Welcome back. I think you're back, I'm Kevin. Good. Yeah, you're good. Uh, you're good. You're good. You're good. Uh, you know, this is a problem, actually. Uh, Dubai banned Discord. So, like, I have to use Discord on a browser. This is why. Oh. 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 Yeah. That's I would awkward. Think that, I would think that, like, UAE, you know, like, would have everything, but we don't have Discord. So, um, but no, I was trying to say... Um, so uh, I was trying to say that, like, if you were to try and manipulate, like, legendary market, right? Um, and let's just say you can buy 10 weapons every day, uh, because on average, about 5 to 10 will sell every day. Uh, not all of them, but let's just say 10 of each weapon type. There's 21 unique legendary Gen 1 weapons, right? From underwater to all the other ones. So multiply that by 10 a day. That's 210 weapons you need to buy up. Now, let, let's skip the details of 
the prices, but let's just say each one costs 2,000 gold. Multiply that by 210. You need 420,000 gold a day to be able to sustain that. And maybe you need to do that for a good two weeks before people can just test the new normal. And two weeks is maybe really say, cutting it short. You maybe need to do that for a month to really get people to like think that weapons should be valued at like 3,000 gold, right? So, or 20,000, multiply that by 30 days, 12.6 million gold. You know how impossible it is to get that much money in a month from even if you include 300 of the richest traders in the game. It's like theoretically impossible, right? So, yeah, again, like you can't really do much market manipulation because either the weapon or the item type is too expensive. You're going to be burning a lot of gold and you can't really have that much money like burnt without you then suffering actual losses and then you, you basically like you've spent money and now you have to start recovering that money or as Enko said the item is just too vast in supply that it's just you can't mm. actually keep up with demand essentially yeah, the so the economy is so big it's very difficult to actually influence it without well some kind of yeah. massive exploit yes so like when Emma's talking about trying to manipulate legendaries up to 3,000 gold yeah you know, he was talking about for all of them now let's just talk about for one of them the pro the thing is like if you just look at you know supply and demand of any kind of like macroeconomics right if somebody buys up frenzy for instance it's actually at 25 or when i i bought one a couple of days ago it's 2500 gold which is pretty high for a, a underwater weapon maybe people are trapped can the hype the, here we know, go deep sea dragon and stuff like that. <laughs> here but, we um, go. so let's say somebody buys them all up to 3000 gold because he's like i i'm i have all these frenzies i have all these underwater precursors for frenzies i want to jack the price up because i want to try to get people to buy these for more expensive later on right so he jacks up to 3,000 gold, and every single time when gets listed under it, he he buys it. Uh, he buys it, so it stays at 3,000 gold. The thing is, is that you've got thousands and thousands of other players who have the capability of making a legendary. Maybe they don't do it because, like as I tell people, it, it's not the greatest thing if you want to make gold. But now they see it's like, oh, there's a legendary I can sell for 3,000 gold, and only costs 1,600 gold to make. I'm gonna go make one. You have thousands of people that are gonna look at that and go, I'm gonna do that. And then they're going to go make Frenzy, and then they're going to go, like, I'm going to go list it under this guy's because I want mine to sell. And then other people are going, well, I want mine to sell, so I'm going to undercut that guy. And then it ends up being back down at 25, 2400, where other people are like, okay, it's not profitable to make more, I'm not going to make anymore. Until those, and then maybe that guy comes back and is like, oh, crap, 15 got listed last night under my price, under 3,000, I'm going to go buy them all up again. And then it'll, it'll cycle back. And eventually, he's going to be sitting there with 300 Frenzies, hoping to sell them at 3,000 gold, and he can't because it's so, just going to be undercut. So this is true, obviously, for items that you can directly create, right? You can obviously directly create yes. a legendary. You can directly craft various items. Now, there, there, is, there is one thing, and this is certainly a bit of a meme, right? Like within the community, this idea of gatekeeping certain items, in particular rare infusions, because obviously with a rare infusion, you can't actually create that yourself as such, right? It, there is a very heavy level of randomness, right? You just have to like, oh, yep, I got lucky and we got a Chark Egg Sack, right? Now, how much influence do Barons hoarding these items or buying up these items, does that in, um, affect the economy in some way? Because I think that is something that perhaps could be a little bit easier to influence. I know that some uh, some Barons are a big fan of obtaining a lot of Aureliums. And of course, well, you know, if you look at the tournament prize pools, for a lot of these big tournaments that you guys have been involved in, right? There's often a lot of Chark infusions. We've got some, you know, Mystic infusions, right? Like, you know, like even have another count or just yet, okay? Uh, but uh, for all this of that, you do see a lot of these very, very high ticket items essentially being part of the uh, of these prize pools there. So is that maybe a little bit easier to potentially manipulate that? I, I, I guess um, you can kind of say, yeah, sure. But then uh, Ainit's actually introduced a couple events in the game that kind of pump enough in the economy where uh, the prices tend to go down. So um, so to give an example, right? Uh, infusions in 20, around 18 and 19 had started to become very famously traded. And that's where like random, a couple randoms start buying them at that price because they just weren't available on the trading post. And Know, to kind of get someone to sell them one they're like hey i'll pay 20k for your chalk i'll pay 18k for your confetti uh, and that trend started right so usually what ended up happening was a couple traders start noticing well okay four wins it drops a lot of these infusions because people oh, try to gamble them on the on, on the boxes right um and this is really honestly maybe more luck than i would say like an actual market move because 
2019 or sorry 20 uh 2018 four wins dropped about people estimate and again this is just guessing by the way no one actually knows but about 150 to 200 infusions right uh that's just from what we can say from when people were trading them that's really the only way to say it so what was happening was when a chalk was selling for 23k and four wins was selling for like uh, 18k or 17k a, a confetti that was selling for 18 to 20k was now all of a sudden selling for 14 15k and so on and so forth with like you know queen bees and liquid iridiums so if you managed to buy enough during that time period um and waited around christmas new year right i want to get a gift for my i don't know girlfriend or i want to gift like my friends in the game or i want to be generous and and gift somebody a prize pool or something like that in december january right this is where these infusions slowly became a peak right because any price decrease from four wins has already been long gone right it's been at least six seven months since four wins um so they would increase and peak again back to their 20k 18k value and then they'd start to drop again closer to four wins uh 2019 actually barely dropped enough so like uh their price actually tanked um and, and some of them kind of held value but some of them tanked because there was actually an increase of items uh, and Anit had started to do this thing where they would introduce Fractal Rush, Dragon Bash, World Boss events. So it kind of like started killing the market because it was, you know, it was adding more and more of these infusions slowly over time. And then again, 2020, people were like, oh yeah, we'll do it again in 2020. Uh, and then people started, actually what Enko was saying about trying to manipulate the Ecto wall. Uh, people were trying to push for that to be 27 silver because you need Ectos to buy these boxes, right? In four wins, you need the Ectos. Um, so then people were like, yeah, yeah, we'll buy Ectos. Uh, it will go up to 28, 29 silver. And because all it took it was like a few people to post like two, 300k of box openings uh, to say I got nothing for people to be discouraged to even go gamble. And so people just didn't touch that. And Ectos stayed at like 21 silver instead of going up to 27. Um, but then later in the year, ain't it because they kept introducing these events that would you know, slowly trickle down more infusions, they kind of reduced the price, uh, especially with the Fractal Rush events that happened uh, around September of this year. Uh, September of this year. Um, and then, of course, uh, this one person in November crashed the entire market, basically rendering the infusions kind of useless uh, until maybe, who knows, if Hainet stops maybe doing a lot of these events, they could go back up in price. We don't know. Um, but it's safe to say, like, you're not going to see 23k chocks 19k confettis uh for another you know let's say eight nine months right it's going to take a while for them to really go back to that artificial price or for anyone to really want to pay that price anymore so mm. that kind of you know yeah. it, so for, oh. oh yeah no uh, I, I, I was going to kind of like um uh, kind of bring this up because this, i think this is a very interesting topic because these items are obviously over the ten thousand, or rather were over the yes. ten thousand gold cap <clears throat> and um I think this kind of adds to the like the sensation of being gatekept or the sensation of these items being inherently inaccessible because a lot of the time you're going to want to go outside of the game to actually obtain them and actually trade them. And like, do you guys think it's actually healthier for the game if either they are worth less than 10,000 gold or a reading that would consider uh, removing the gold value transaction cap? on the trading post such that you could say list an item or purchase an item for 15,000 gold to make sure that all these things are actually going through the TP, through these conventional channels, as opposed to kind of going, you know, uh, through the back door as it were. Because, you know, we're talking about legendaries, right? And how, you know, people will kind of react to that and people will, will do stuff there. But in a way, there's less of a capacity for players to actually react or even interact with these items because a lot of the the actual a lot of the transactions don't actually happen within the context of the actual game so oh. i've been a proponent of anet removing the 10k limit on the trading post for a long time because um yeah you know as we talked about earlier the reason why inf uh, confettis and shocks were so expensive was just because somebody's like oh i think i can sell it for this amount and then everybody else kind of just followed suit like again it was a perception if you remove the 10k cap which doesn't really make it like i guess that made sense in like the first couple years i don't know if they have a technical limitation on it but it's like they should just make the cap 200,000 gold because that's what the the the, the what limit on the wallet is that's how much gold you can actually carry so 
if they do that, then like the chalks and the confetti, the conurs, uh, we would have seen the 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 actual supply um, influencing the price more because we had something to actually gauge it. So for everything under 10k on the trading post, um, you can't sell it for extraordinary amounts. Like you can't double your value or, like when you're selling it off off the trading post, like an exchange or overflow, because people just go look at the they'll look at the trading post. It's like no, that's that's what the general market supply and demand is saying that this thing's worth. When you have the cap on the 10k once you're above that nobody knows what it's actually worth so they're just like i'm going to get whatever i can get for so if they remove it and then somebody listed a, a chalk x for 15k if somebody thought that that was a good deal they would instant buy it if they didn't then it would sit there until somebody else listed one for 14k and 13k and so forth until you know we found the equilibrium on where they would just sell exactly so the 10k cap has, i think has been a a long mistake that Enet really should remove mm. unless they feel that there is, unless there's like an actual technical reason why they have it like that. And on top of that also, it because when we're obviously trading off the trading post because we're trying to save on the taxes, right? So if they sold a 15K item on the trading post, you know, 15% of that, of that item in the gold value would get consumed. That would get taken out. It would actually would help with the gold inflation a little bit too. So yeah, they definitely should remove it. And like the... The entire four win thing, as MN was saying, where it's like you had a couple of people like Sukin posts um, like 100, 200k uh, drop rates on Reddit uh, at the, usually at the beginning of the event. Um, I honestly kind of wish that he would wait for like a week so that other people would actually try it themselves too. Because the people, a lot of people just go, it's like, oh, I look at that. He didn't get one. I was only going to open 5,000. I'm not even going to try. Uh, and then they don't even bother participating in that part of the, the festival. Um, like I opened 1.7 million, but I didn't post my results until like the last day because I I didn't open them till like the last day, and I didn't I didn't get a single chalk <laughs> out of all of this. Oh, so, oh. Um, yeah. But yeah, when when you have people posting like the their drops like the very first day, it really does stifle everybody else who from like even trying it. So um, four wins, a lot of people are saying it's like, oh, this is a chance for me to get chalks. This is a chance for us to get rid of the ectos. Four. Uh, Ainet was really using four wins to try to balance out the T1 through T6 basic crafting materials because you could throw in like green green wood logs and stuff like that, softwood logs. You could throw in all of them and they all had a conversion rate to it. And the entire point of that is to try to get them to all balance out to a certain price point. But when nobody participates in those festivals, that doesn't happen. So Ainet really was using that as, as a way to try to correct the markets on a lot of these things, to try to consume like the, the massive glut of materials we had just because a lot of these materials aren't used that often um but because they people don't participate that didn't really happen so there there are some things that they can do with um in game that would help correct laws remove the 10k cap um like have infusions be account bound you know stuff like that a lot of that would go a long way so for us to actually see what the actual value of these infusions are instead of just what the perceived value is yeah, absolutely. That's and that is exactly what we were talking about earlier, right? Like how these these items, like you know, what is that even worth? Well, we decide, right? Like we'll figure it out and kind of uh, go from there. So I think you know, having having the economy actually interact with them would indeed be a really really good thing for the gamer overall. But that that kind of like uh, you know is an interesting thing there. Like how how important do you? view as a non-trading post trading to the economy of the game because obviously this is a you know a, the way a very easy way to generate a bit more profit and to you know not lose value in a transaction is by avoiding the tp so suppose arena just just said all right you can now they they figure out a way to apply the gold cap to items as well for example right and now you can only trade 500 golds worth of items per week as well so if you want to say send mystic coins to someone it will just say oh you can't do that but you know in the same way that you can't send five uh, you know you can't do over 500 gold right like you know 500 gold caps you if they just just it will be very difficult to do that obviously but suppose they did find a way to do that like what does that actually do what does that look like um afterwards? that would actually like so that one thing well that would actually uh manage the gold inflation even at a much faster rate than it is because more people would be forced to just go through the trading post, right? Yeah. Trading post takes your 15% tax. Uh, so in a way, it would actually be good for the game's inflation. So we, if they, if they do that, like you're talking about five, six years down the line of the game still alive, um, like prices will actually remain kind of fairly stable. They won't be going up and uh, up too much in value, right? Because um, 
you look at it now, like from year one, uh, legendary weapons in around year one and two were around a thousand gold, thousand five hundred uh, slowly, and now they're they, they reached the peak of three thousand, now they're two thousand. So the increase of that uh, and per, like you know just basically restricting uh, male trades like that, yeah, it would it would help with the inflation, uh, more of an annoyance to the player popula population. So uh, I could see mostly as a solution to counter that. People will just use the guild bank uh unless they apply that the same way they do with the gold yeah, system they where did, you also they would. they would so if they do that like then also the guild bank becomes an inconvenience um but, but that would kind of you know disconnect everybody from each other so then people are only forced to go to the trading post uh but it would make for i don't know if i would say a healthier economy but it would make for some corrections like inflation uh, but i feel like it would kind of deter a lot of people from getting to where they need to be because like if i want something i usually know someone who has it right if i want 20 sets of t6 materials right i want to make 20 weapons or something or if someone says i need uh these amount of items to make whatever decorations i want in the guild hall i can't do that now because the person that i know can't do that for me every day i can't go to them and just do it all in a mail transaction mm. right i have to go to the trading post uh, so I think that, in a sense, would give a negative reaction to the player base because now you've made it inconvenient for them. No, I'm, I'm very um, much inclined to yeah. agree with that, actually. Like, you know, I all of a sudden running stuff like, well, or certainly from my perspective, right? Like maybe, you know, to a certain extent, it could even be slightly better for like the kind of the, the average player. So I am speaking obviously out of personal interest here, but all of a sudden running stuff like these tournaments would just be impossible, right? Because like, oh... Now I've got to farm half a million gold on my own. Well, you know, good luck with that, right? Like, <laughs> like well, yeah. <laughs> on the flip side, you know, if Anna does something like that, they would make a ton of actual money. You yeah, know, that, right? yeah, Ultra gold yeah. would become yeah. super, super valuable. Oh, yeah, all right, so, let's go. Right now, like, if, if you got all of your, all the account, all the donations for the tournaments in gold, um, you it would be annoying for you because you'd have to tell people what accounts to send to, but you got 40 accounts. So 40 accounts at 500 gold a week, you can accept 20,000 gold a week, except that they just become different ones and you could buy over stuff on the training post and the send it to main. If they also, if they added, um, if they somehow added the value of items to contribute to a weekly cap, um, it would, you know, they would have to actually have to tie it to the whatever value selling on the trading post, unless they just used a vendor value and then it wouldn't really matter anyways. But um, if they tied it to the value in the training post, on a technical level, the trading post lag would get even worse. I would Ooh. actually say that would break it. Ooh. Every single time somebody tried to mail something, it would have to take like 20 seconds to like, okay, how much is this worth? Can you send it? And all those data calls to the trading post database from everybody who's sending mail, no matter what it is, it would it would break the game. So they obviously can't do that. Yeah. I actually think that they should raise the gold cap on week the weekly gold cap to at least a thousand. 500 gold cap inconveniences players too much, and it honestly doesn't do anything to people that are actually doing RMT, like selling gold. Because if you're, if you're selling gold, you're, you're like, there's no limit on how much you can send. So if you, yeah, if you are an RMT, you're, you're buying gold. Oh, okay. I, I bought a thousand gold. I got to wait two weeks. Okay. If 20 people are buying a thousand gold from the same RMT, -er, that guy can still send out all that gold with no problem. It may, like, he'll probably get tracked down like that. But if they raise it to a thousand, I think it would inconvenience a lot less people. Um, but if they, yeah, if they added a, um, some way to factor in the value of items into the gold thing, I think it would break the game. I would be more of a fan of them adding in player to player direct trading. Um, and then like a cash on delivery type system, like a lot of other MMOs have. Um, but yeah, that combined with removing the 10k cap, I actually think would make, uh, trading the game a lot smoother. Now, somebody did ask if they remove the 10k cap, would that get rid of like reddit training trading or like overflow uh no i don't think it would because people are still going to try to avoid the taxes and quite honestly uh i don't use exchange for trades i'm a mod there but i don't use it for trades i have traded one item on exchange and it was a dusk that i sold to simsels <laughs> two years ago <laughs> <laughs> because i i do everything through the trading post i i honestly don't i um i don't trust people whoa so, Whoa! If you if you if you if you trade with me off the trading post, you will send first. <laughs> and so I and I just don't really buy or sell stuff on there because all the stuff I do, it's not worth it. So I actually don't use exchange for trading like at all. I just help moderate it. Mm. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, obviously that you know the, the idea of even doing that would be a little bit impractical, but it's kind of interesting to speculate about what that actually might do. And you know, kind of on, on that uh, on that note there as well. I mean, like suppose they did add like a player trading feature, because obviously a lot of people, you know, one of the, I would actually say this is probably one of the things that people in a way missed the most from Guild Wars One was the fact that there was no yeah. there there is no essential player trading feature in Guild Wars 2. And these systems can coexist, right? For example, uh, World of Warcraft obviously has its auction house, but it also has a trading system as well. Like, you know, what, what, do you, what, what do you guys think that would, what, how would that affect Guild Wars 2? If you have that in Guild Wars 2 and you add a similar system where you can simply you know, have a transaction with another player, uh, what does that do? Like, what does that look like? So that will, so first of all, if they did add player to player trading, say tomorrow, um, they would have to actually figure out ways to balance out the game's uh, supply of gold and supply of materials, right? Because now you've given people incentive not to go to the trading post because there's a tax there. So uh, if they were to do player-to-player -player trading, I feel like maybe implement the tax there because uh, the inflation like needs to be like controlled. They need to be able to make the inflation work uh, because the last thing you want is like four years later, the game now like it takes you... Um, you know how in World of Warcraft, to repair your armor, it was a couple tens of gold early on in the game. And then at this point, to repair your armor in World of Warcraft is like something like three, four thousand gold, right? Like having a hundred thousand gold in World of Warcraft now means nothing. Versus say that in Guild Wars 2, a hundred thousand gold in Guild Wars 2 is a, a lot of money in, in the game, right? So they need to, like, sure, it will incentivize people to trade together, but they need to figure out ways to keep gold sinks, keep math sinks. Uh, so that they could properly balance out the economy. You don't want player-to-player uh, -player trading and then defeats the whole purpose of even having a trading pool. So they need to add a method that allows it that you can trade with other people, but there's a catch to it, right? There's a condition. Yeah, well, I think I got a solution for that. Um, if you trade items to people, uh, items are only one way. You have to trade them for gold. So uh, you can't do items for items. So you want to if I wanted to trade um, a Connor infusion for 10 legendaries, it would have to be two separate transactions. I would sell the Connor. They would put gold amount in. There'd be a 5% tax taken from that. And then we'd have to do another trade where then the legendaries go back the other way and I have to pay like gold back for it. Um, yeah, I guess people could kind of kind of deal with that because they could just do like a one gold transaction um, to avoid it. The Because honestly, the reason why you want player to player trading is like if I wanted to sell a Bifrost um, and I wanted to sell it to a specific person and I wanted to do it like in game, like not with mail and hope I don't get scammed. Uh, the only way to really do that right now is that I contact the guy in Discord and I'm like, all right, I'm listing it on the trading post right now, hit buy. <laughs> like that's how you have to do it. So that's why, it, um, and I honestly have seen trades done like that in the past, like that before like exchange and overflow were a thing, like early on the game. Uh, I remember people talking about doing that. It's just like, hey, you know, you would see someone trying to sell something in map chat even though they're not supposed to. And they're like, hey, I'm, I'm about to list this precursor on uh, like on the trading post for like 450 gold. If you want to buy it, you know, just I'm, I'm listing it in three, two, one now. And then you would see someone got someone go, hey, I, I just bought it. And the guy's like, yeah, I got the gold. It was, it was really dumb. It was really, really <laughs> stupid. So if you allow player to player trading, um, like maybe have the value for it be tied to what they're going for in it. So like so we were talking about before, like if there was a cap to uh, to males. Um, for items, then you they'd have to calculate off the off the trading post. Now, if you were actually doing a trade, and they're like, "Oh, you're selling a, a bifrost in, in mail," okay, that thing's valued at this. Um, the other guy will provide this cash on delivery, and we'll just take out five percent. So you save versus the trading post taxes, but some are still out. But this is so you can do like dirt dirt trades. Like the trading post would then be for like, I don't want to worry about it's honestly the trading post will be more for the lazy people it's honestly going to be it's like i don't have to worry about finding a buyer i'm just gonna list it here and have it have the system take care of it have the system take care of finding a buyer for me if i wanted to find a buyer myself then i then the game will encourage player player interaction will encourage trading directly with people because you get a discount on trading with uh with people but they'd have to set up a system to do that and um with how long the game has been going on like now and ain't it the reason why, like, they've actually told us this because we we tried talking about this. Uh, something came up with Exchange. I don't remember what, what happened, but we actually, like, try to, like, talk to them about this. And they, they actually said the reason why they have the mail system the way it is is because they don't want people to trade directly with people. Like, Arena actually doesn't want people to do direct trades with each other. They want people to use a trading post. 
the mail system the way it is right now it's more so it's like hey if you want to give a friend some items or you want to send them send them like food or something to help out with then you can it was not it was not intended for people to be doing off trading post trades because they wanted everything funneled through the trading post because for some reason they thought that that would prevent exploiting and scamming other people which i mean it kind of does but they've also never they also never banned off trade uh, off tp tra uh, trades like they did tell us it was at our own risk like we have messages from uh from one of the devs where it's like you know we don't condone this but and like everything you do is at your own risk so we're not going to ban it but we don't encourage it and if people submit support tickets about this we won't really respond so they they actually don't want people to do trade uh trader to or player to player direct trading but they also don't want to upset people by outright banning it which it's just like I mean, you you got to pick one way or another yeah like, this is also why like if they like if you ever get scammed even if you have sometimes like screenshot proof like hey like we agreed to yeah the, it's not good enough right trade. yeah, yeah. You know, like like for example even if you recorded the video like saying in the party chat in game like hey do you accept this trade deal that i'm giving you this item for this item or this gold for this and then the person says yes you say yes and then you send them and even in the mail you even type the subject type a description uh, and then sometimes you could send the proof to Aina and then like, sometimes they'll tell you like, yeah, we're, we're going to take care of this. Uh, the, the, you know, we can't give you details, but the person in question was suspended. Uh, or sometimes they'll tell you, uh, we're unable to recover your items. Uh, next time, please make sure that you go through the trading post, safer system, uh, right? So yeah, like sometimes you'll get lucky depending on your on the dev that handles your ticket. Sometimes they might even return you the item. Sometimes they just tell you, uh, we can't return you the item. And, and sometimes because of that is... Say your scammer trades the item on the trading post. They've already sold it. So that item's already been funneled on the trading post. That means for them to return your item, they have to duplicate it. Because now someone else has your item on the trading post. Right? Someone else has bought your item. So... Can, can that, I address someone in chat, actually? Want to address someone? Sure. Yeah, but oh, that, actually, that's the sorry, reason. Sorry, I thought you were... Uh, go ahead and finish. But, oh, no, I'm uh, not, actually, yeah. no. Like, that, that's kind of why like sometimes they can't give you back your item. Yeah, sure. I, I'm trying to figure out what this guy is saying. Is he trying to claim that I'm against player-to-player -player trading because we would lose control of the trade of the market? Uh, wait, uh, is this is this Sword Art 19? Yeah, we, Sword yeah. Art 19. Um, I, I mean, I I I, well, I don't I don't know to be honest because of course the the opposite would be true, all right? I mean, <laughs> uh, in that case, if there was a lot of if there was a lot of player player trading going on, obviously it would you know it, you know if people were doing that, then you'd have like more influence there. Uh, in a way, right? Because if people were doing it, then, I actually you know... want everybody to use a trading post. I I would rather people use a trading post, um, as long as ain't it ruined the 10k cap on it. I, yeah. I would actually be there's okay. Actually, with there's no there's no disadvantage. Yeah, like sure, like if there's more incentive to choose use the trading post, yeah, people can't player to player trade. But actually, um, hardcore TP flipping, buying and selling items, buy low, sell high, that would return. Uh, like that would actually encourage more activity on the trading post, actually allowing more things for people to make money on. So right. there's there's no disadvantage if instantly uh, the trading post was the be all end all and player to player trading was forever done. Like, all right, sorry, you didn't listen. I said that they should remove the caps. They they have the caps in place because of RMT reasons. I don't, actually don't think that I I don't like the caps. I think that they should just get better at their RMT detection and not cap the. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, if you, you know, because of course you you can send, yeah, sending five hundred gold, but you can send like you know a hundred k in legendaries if you really wanted yeah. to, right? Like, like you're not I doing anything with that. I never said right? I wanted them to like you said why did so why did you say it should be limited? I don't want it to be limited. Ain't it wants of it to be limited because they're trying to restrict RMT trading? I think the way they're doing it is kind of dumb because five hundred gold, it it hurts normal players too much because five hundred gold nowadays like 500 gold like won't get you honestly that many items so it restricts player to player trading like if i'm just if i want to send stuff to a friend it hurts it but it doesn't actually stop the rm tiers because there's no limit on gold sending so if it, their system doesn't work to prevent rmt so honestly they should just remove it and get better at detecting these rmt sellers so everything you're saying about what i want in chat is blatantly false and not what i've said well and also to, to be clear guys the re the reason why the tax is here is to basically keep the economy intact right like what emma was talking about with other games is that when you have player to player trading like you don't suck gold out of the economy essentially right like the, the issue with with guild wars so think about it guys right like you know 
um you know th th you know if you can compare it to something like real life right i'm no economist but you know look okay in real life guys okay you don't have like <laughs> squillions of money being printed all the time right in guild wars 2 you've got thousands of players generate i mean th think about how much gold right gets generated like in pvp with all the liquid gold you get there or from like a daily at or from an octo bots right okay PvP. bots going crazy yeah, there's bots going crazy right there's like so much like money being printed in in guild wars 2 all the time right like people are money printing machines right all day in fact that's one of the biggest things about the game right you know like guild wars 2 a big component of it is farming gold right is generating wealth and farming up items so unless you have some kind of consumption right some some kind of drain then you just end up with this uh, absurdly piled up economy over time right and that's why you know that's why arenanet want to use the trading process why they want you to always have that 15 percent tax because if you don't right then all of a sudden right you've got everyone you know all, items end up really really you know the entire economy just inflates over time and prices go up then and your gold is just like you know you have these ridiculous numbers there over time uh, there as I mean, well. Like, so someone was saying, like, isn't gold to gem also draining that? Like, that's just one way of, like, sinking, uh, controlling a gold sink. That's, I mean, the fact that you also have the trading post is also going to contribute to that. Like, yeah, there's people that maybe convert gold to gems and things like that. Um, but that's just one sink. The trading post is another sink. So, I mean, I'm not sure what you're trying to imply there. Like, that's the only solution. No, that there needs to be other solutions. This is why also... Uh, from time to time, you'll see like Anet trying to induce mat sinks, right? Sometimes there's a base material that's just too much in supply of. And uh, if you go to like, let's just compare uh, the last eight, nine months, uh, which this is probably like from the new economists, which we don't know who we don't know who they are. But like, if you notice, like in the Icebrook Saga, they've been introducing some sinks, right? Like uh, your or Oracle Alchem, uh, your um, Elderwood logs, you've had like a couple base mats that they've used for like some skins or some items in the game that you can gold sink into, mat sink into. So, I mean, no, gold to gems is one thing, but you need more. Like you, that alone is not going to solve your gold problem. Like that's just one of them. Yeah. And your dark brain kind of brings up a really good point here as well, right? Is that once you have an item in this game, you just have it forever, right? You like yeah. never need to make another yeah. one, right? Um, you know, there, there, Guild Wars 2 is, is, somewhat different to other mmos in this regard is that like once you obtain something it just stays there forever you'll never replace it right like you know if you yeah, get and if you get your legendary you <laughs> yeah yeah unless, unless you delete unless it or write, override like, it right or yeah are or you sure whatever. you want to destroy this item yes yes and then like, oh i destroyed scholar runes four sigils all the upgrades mm. um, yeah. the only time you ever need another one is like oh i changed builds and yeah. i overrode it and then, oh, now I'm changing builds back and I need a new one. Um, a lot of that, if you have an extractor, you can get around that now. With legendaries, that's completely gone. Armory, there's even that. Um, this is the same problem I was saying with infusions because they never get consumed. You, you can slot it, you can use it for however long you want. And then when you're done with it, like, oh, I don't, I don't like this, how the chalk eggs head looks anymore. I'll, I'll just take it off and sell it. Once it enters the economy, it never gets destroyed. Um, upgrades are kind of like that right now too, because enough people have extractors or legend legendary gear now, where it's just like, oh, I don't want this force digital anymore. I'll go sell it. So if you have an extractor, yeah, you need you things mean. to be consumed. You need things to be destroyed to control um, just like prices going to going to crap. Exactly. Yeah, and that's exactly why you have these systems there um, within the game there to kind of counteract this here as well. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I, I, I think we can we can kind of move on from this. I think we talked about this uh, for a good amount of time. I want to move on because I because there is another really big topic that I want to talk about, and it's about kind of demystifying the barons, right? You know, like I do love this expression, so I'm going to say it again, right? You know, I'll, you, you guys are typically viewed as you know mustachioed villains, just kind of twirling there in the background, and Enka, of course, maybe not not pulling that one off. Emma, maybe, maybe a, little, a little bit a, a little bit more so able to do that. And I want to talk a lot about um where wealth comes from in the game like where gold comes from because uh, in, in my experience a really big frustration a lot of players have with the game is in farming gold is how to obtain wealth how to obtain gold uh in guild wars 2 it's, it's something that you know like is very a very popular topic everywhere all over the place all that sort of thing uh and I kind of want to go off on a different thing because I you know obviously we did have a chat about this on our previous podcast. Definitely go watch that, guys. Okay, um, 
How do you think ArenaNet could communicate to players a little bit better how they are actually farming gold? Because obviously when you farm in Guild Wars 2, you typically obtain materials. Then you hit deposit and it's gone. So I think for a lot of players, it can potentially appear that you aren't really increased, you're not really gaining a lot of value out of that. You know, if you do a Drizzlewood Coast, for example, which is obviously a very popular farm to do, you're going to get a huge amount of, uh, you know, materials from all different tiers. You're, you know, you're going to be gathering that up there. But in terms of actual gold, like the gold coin number, it's not going to increase a crazy amount. And I think that sort of thing leads to this perception that, you know, oh, it's hopeless. I, I'll never be rich. I can never be rich. All these barons are simply I mean, destroying me. Like, what, what does Arena need to do? Point out what, I just want to yeah. point out what Enko's doing right now, right? I'm sure he's probably like um, memeing on the chat now or something. But so you're talking no, about like, the what you, this is how you make gold. <laughs> yeah, like, so this is literally stuff that you guys do on a daily basis. You use a lot of these materials to make whatever you're trying to make, right? Whatever item you're trying to get. Except we do that, but we also sell that stuff to the trading post. Like, if people are saying like, oh, there's a secret method. It's, think of whatever people need. That's what you're going to make money on, right? Demand. So this is it. Like, Balts of Silk, Gossamer, uh, Mithril, uh, other types of metals, other types of woods. It's literally stuff, leather, like stuff that you use on a daily basis. We're just not only consuming it for us, we're also listing it and making money on that. So... And again, like early on, you can't maybe make, you know, hundreds and hundreds of stacks of these, possibly thousands of stacks of these, because you need, you know, to grow your gold exponentially. You need to slowly build up, right? But when you get to that level, then you can talk about doing like, you know, 500 stacks of leather, 500 stacks of wood, 500, like, it just takes time. So that's the TLDR before we actually get into the you know details of it. But yeah. Enko's basically doing it right now. He's making money right now, so. He is indeed going crazy, but, uh, you know, like, getting some, getting some silk going there as well, uh, of course. And that, that's definitely a topic I want to talk about there. Like, you know, like, what is the nature of wealth generation in Guild Wars 2? Where does this value come from? And why does it work? Um, but, yeah, I, I do kind of really, really want to hit this point here as well. Like, do you think Arena, do, or do you think the game does a good job in communicating to players that they are obtaining something valuable uh, or or like what like wh what is what is going on there because where do you think this frustration actually comes from in farming gold is it just a misunderstanding of how the reward structures in the game work are the reward structures too confusing for players to understand with all the materials that get thrown at you or like what do you guys have any uh, opinions on that or any thoughts on that matter there as well i think that the gold making in this game it's a lot like raids it's a lot like other content where with guild wars 2 um, the game doesn't tell you this is end game. Go do this. Like Guild Wars Two is kind of like, hey, you've got all this, all these options available to you. Pick what you want your end game to be, right? So in the same way, like you know, gold making for some people is an end game, but it's the same thing with that. It's just like you've got all these things here. It's up to you to to, to turn around and make the gold. So when you ask, like, does the game tell you to this is how you make gold in the game? Like, um, because honestly, like a lot of people. Think of it as like a gold common denominator. They try to break everything down in like gold, um, but then they don't actually look in the material stores to like figure out okay, what can I convert to gold? Um, everything, if you think about it, like how many different things can you convert to gold? Like in your wallet, like all the different things, all the currency they put in our wallet nowadays. So in it, the game doesn't tell us how to do that. It is up to the player to to choose how to do that. Just like how it's it's up to the player to choose what they want to do in the game after they hit eighty. So. Some of it, I feel like that that may just be the theme that that Anet's put on Guild Wars 2. It's kind of like, you know, you you play your own story. Um, and for gold making in particular, it can be a little frustrating. But I also for this game, you also don't exactly need a lot of gold to like do what you need, do what you want to do. Like if you actually think about how much gold you actually need to like get full ascended, you know, to be able to get like a decent looking character, uh, it honestly doesn't cost a super a large amount on this. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would agree that the game doesn't give you a good way. It's like, Hey, this, you know, we just added, uh, this new crafting recipe, you know, this, this will, this should make you gold. Like, and honestly, it's because the economy in this game is more player run. Um, yes, balance patches can affect like tastes of people, like what they want to buy and stuff like that. But for the most part, it's kind of just like, it's a little bit like real life. You can do whatever you want with your gold and it's up to you to, to figure out how to, convert that into like more and more gold. So 
is, is that the game's fault? Um, I actually, I actually would put that more on the player community. Okay. I think it's more the player. Uh, but would, for example, more in-game tools be useful? Uh, for example, you know, we'll often be citing Guild Wars 2 efficiency, right? Like, you can go and look at your material storage, and it will tell you the value of that material storage, right? For example, would a tool in the game, like maybe in the wallet, indicating how much gold your materials are worth, right? Or maybe being able to, you know, like, it have something like efficiency in the game where it shows you, okay, right, you know, like, I've got, you know, a few hundred gold in materials that I just farmed, right? Like being able to actually say, oh, right, I've just gained 50 gold in wealth by farming the game for a few hours or something like that. Because I think unless you actually go for that, then, uh, yeah, the TP does obviously, but again, that's kind of an extra step, right? You, yeah, you're, you, you're, you do have to do some extra steps. Yeah, you're, you're going to have to, you're, yeah, gonna, I mean, yeah, you're going to have to go and calculate like... that. What about like some kind of aggregate factor or something that tells you that directly in the game? Because then I think, you know, if you, if you have the ability to say, right, I farmed Drizzlewood Coast, and I got 30 gold for doing it, right? Then I think player goes, oh, great, I got 30 gold. But right now, they'll go, I did Drizzlewood Coast, and I got all these items that I don't really understand fully, and I don't really know what that was worth. Why did I do that, right? <laughs> Does that make any um, sense? Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, because, like, uh, Willer's in chat saying something like, oh, you know, when you mouse over something on the tooltip, like, maybe just show, like, the, the TV value on there. I think that'll run in the same problem we talked about earlier about when we're talking about, oh, if they added a value cap on items, like they would have to link that back to the trading post. And like the trading post, it's not the most stable. Thing. The, the in-game browser, it's actually just a website that it points to. Like the, the infrastructure of the trading post isn't the most stable. And I think that if every single time somebody moused over an item, instead of just the vendor value there, which is a static amount, it's if you moused over an item, every single time you put your mouse over an item, it was it was doing a callback <laughs> to the trading post to like check the value of it. Just think of how bad the game would get, like lag wise. Like well, so. I mean, maybe that's no excuse. Maybe it's time for a rework. Maybe it's time yeah, to update. Oh yeah, it. I, I actually right? think they should rework the training yeah. post. Like, well, I mean, the game engine's also what twenty years old now. The game engine is old, but like, um, like I think yeah, to rework the trading post, they do actually have to work on the engine uh, oh. because, like Anko said, it's literally a browser right now. Like light bulb, light bulb's on the right head. Easy solution uh, for this: allow third-party add-ons. Whoa! So ah, that that, that's getting into efficiency. Efficiency. Right you could have uh, you could have efficiency make an add-on that just like how we have Arc, it's an in-game add-on that when you mouse over it, it you, instead of doing the trading post calls, you're accessing GW2 efficiencies or the or GW2 build well, TP, or and just it'll the have a little mouse yeah. up that goes like, oh, this like. Uh, if you go on BLTC and like it says like this is what it can be used for crafting. This is like the sell price. This is like the stuff that sold in like the last twenty minutes. Like the, how how often it sold. If if Anet would allow us to use third party tools without fear of you know getting banned or you know had better guidelines on that, uh, I think the player community could generate a lot of these tools. So maybe if Anet doesn't have the capability or like the capacity to do it because they're all working End of Dragons or in the past, like why couldn't we have a DPS meter in game? I mean, there's a DPS meter in, in the dev side of things. Um, like why why can't they just make some of these tools public? Like we have a comment API, give we have a TP API, uh, allow us to create add-ons for the game that would then utilize those APIs to show this stuff. So the like Guild Wars 2 efficiencies farming tracker. Uh, I don't know how many how many of you guys have actually used it. Um, like, there's some quirks with it. There's, like, ways to manipulate it, like, uh, like what you did. But if you're actually trying to use it for the purpose of, like, I'm in Drizzlewood Coast. Uh, the meta just started. I hit start on this farming tracker, and I go do the event. I'm in here for an hour. I, I've actually only done the Drizzlewood Coast meta twice, so I don't actually know how long it takes. Um, you know, I was in there for an hour, and then I can go look at efficiency, and it's like, oh, an hour. Um, this is... Here's a list of all the items I obtained uh, while I was playing this thing. And then um, it has like a total gold value. Like we have tools like that. A lot of people just might not know about it. So it may take some time like, hey, people need to go know about it. Guild Wars 2 Efficiency has a farming tracker. Silver Sight has a farming tracker that I asked them to make because of the quirks with the efficiency that I didn't like. So his has a lot more like... Uh, functionality that is selectable like you could pick what it actually monitors um there are tools out there like that it's just that people i guess people need to know about it i guess mm. I, and that's why i i guess i would be very i would love to push for in-game because 
I mean, add-ons are great for the likes of you and I, right? Because, you know, we, we like that kind of stuff. But the average player is never going to do it. Like, the average yeah, player is never going to install Arc DPS. It's just it's not going to happen, right? You know, and, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, but it's just, you know, people aren't going to go... Because, again, you, you want to you wanna minimize the steps players have to take, right? And, yeah, I think the chat's having some suggestions. You can kind of, like, cash the prices. You can say, like, oh, this is the average price over the last 24 hours or, like, over the last week or, or, or whatever would be necessary, right? There could be a few approaches that uh could be taken and they're and also yeah i think stuff like the farming tracker is actually really good i, I would definitely encourage players to do that obviously yeah as you, as you mentioned you know you, you have to use it, honestly. I was obviously using it in a little troll fashion Your for video? my old yeah. video. They had 60, 68 gold, hey, 68k gold now, and now we're talking, right? But yeah, I think if you do that and you say do a run, and this is actually um uh, the, my favorite example of this is actually uh, dragon response missions. I don't know if you guys have done research in this or you know how, how good that is, but a lot of people would say that like stuff like strikes and dragon response missions are garbage rewards. This is actually false, right? Um, if you actually crunch the numbers on this with dragon response missions and you farm them fairly efficiently, it's not great, but it's not garbage. Like, you know, um, a, pl a Planix, a friend of mine, he actually did some proper research on this. Like, did, he, did like, uh, he did like eight hours of DRM straight. Now, that's dedication, right? Um, um, and ran a tracker. You know, he had five people running a tracker. And it turns out that you actually get like 17 gold an hour by farming dragon response, which is, again, not amazing. Obviously, you know, like the good farms that you're kind of pushing 30 gold. Uh, and obviously the really high end stuff, like the fractal farms, you're pushing 50 gold an hour. But it's not absolute trash. And I think this is where you do run into these perception issues where things are see they're considered to be far worse than they actually are and that's you know and and that's you know if you get lucky you could well back in the day you could get lucky and like kind of roll the dice and win a lot of money from the volcanic storm caller but that kind of got squashed right like when arena made them a lot easier to get uh have a more direct obtainable way but yeah i think uh, having stuff like this within the game or peripheral to the game would kind of demystify a lot of this stuff like you know like what is that item worth what did i just get from this like how much have i obtained after doing this you know um it, it's really really good because outside of i mean if you if you, outside of stuff like um you know to quarthal fractals pvp like you aren't seeing that gold number go up a crazy amount or something like raids right for example getting two gold for killing the raid boss like that gold number doesn't necessarily go up very much on its own which you know kind of gets players a little bit lost i think when it comes to the yeah. the economy itself well, for sure i think it's here's the, the thing Pe people yeah. people lose the perception of like sometimes you don't have to actually gain actual gold like you could for example when people say like strikes is not a bad way of uh, not a good way of earning gold well, if you think about it, like if you do strikes every day, you can actually save up enough of the crystals to get ascended gear, mm. which costs about 400 gold. Exactly. So it's not just about making gold. You also need to figure out ways to save gold. Precisely. So if you could do strikes every day consistently, you'll have enough crystals to buy like every piece of the uh, ascended gear box. You just saved about 400 gold worth of crafting. Right? I think people sometimes often think of like, I have to make the money, not necessarily mm. find ways to save my money somehow. Right. So, and I think... That's why some some things like don't give them that perception. Yeah, a huge amount of the game is about not spending gold. You're absolutely right. You know, it's like oh, getting you know, and that's why raids uh, and fractals. A, a lot of people, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, raids aren't worth it. This is actually not true. Like, if you do raids, you're getting magnetite shards. You're getting potentially a few ascended items, right? Like, you know, maybe even like five. You could, I, you know, I've seen. You know, if you get really lucky, you can roll like five ascended drops. Right, if you're doing a full clear of raids, maybe even more than that if you're really lucky. Right, in addition to the currencies, and the same thing with fractals. Right, like you could RNG, like boom, you've got an, you know you drop an ascended coat or something like that, and all these things increase your account value. Right, and I think that's what we almost need to kind of figure out a way to change the perception of. Like Guild Wars Two is not a gold game. I think a lot of people perceive it that way, but really it's a account value game. Right, like it is. I want to upgrade my account. I want to get my character geared i want to you know eventually uh you know get these unique cosmetics like these these fun cosmetics and, and upgrade my account in some ways and that the there are more than one way to do it in fact the main the main way of doing that is not actually really through earning gold a lot of it is like account bound stuff that you'll actually encounter in the world on a fairly regular basis i mean you know you can go and talk to any raider here who like raids a lot obviously enko um definitely one of the best examples of this like i mean well i don't know what you do with your ascended gear but i mean my entire you, you don't want to see my bank like trust me like i know you guys have seen my inventory but you don't want to see that um it's just 
full of Ascended, right? Like, and that's just thousands and thousands of gold in, in junk, right, at this point, right? Because I've got so much of it uh, that it just doesn't have any value anymore. But to a new player, to a newer player, like, getting an Ascended drop is a big deal because that item is essentially, like, a 50 gold drop has just appeared in my inventory, right, for completing this content. In addition to a lot of the... Uh, I have three characters yeah. like this. Oh, wow. By the way, like, <laughs> one thing, um, like, I think, like, also people think, like, I have to have like liquid gold, like items I can trade for value, right? And the same with raw gold. Um, when, if you look at your, I mean, there's been people I remember that like would put their account on efficiency and they'd be like, oh, my account's worth 300,000 gold account value, right? Or my account's worth 500,000 gold account value, but I only have a, I only have 500 gold to my name. I'm poor. Uh, mm. No, you're not. You have 500,000 gold worth of items bound to your account. You'll yeah. probably collect things over time and like your account is valuable you just don't have purchasing power right purchasing power is maybe low but your account is worth a lot like you, you're still rich right you just don't have purchasing power right so someone who has that much gold like 200,000 account value 300,000 400,000 500,000 and even if you don't have a thousand two thousand gold uh on the spot or you don't have like materials or things I mean you're 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 pretty rich like you've probably bound countless legendaries you've bound some ascended you've bound some legendary armor you've done something in the game that's worth a val of value right and that's bound to your account so i think people need to also stop looking at it as like i have to have things where i can use to buy stuff if your account is already worth a lot of gold even if it's just bound that's still okay that that, that means you're pretty rich in the game you've done a lot of content which means your account is worth more you've gone through a lot of things in the game yeah uh, and, you know, I mean, like, you know, I I'm definitely one of those players, right? Because, you know, like, I, I have definitely played the game a lot. And I'm actually going on efficiency now to see what my actual value is. Uh, but yeah, I very rarely have any kind of like <laughs> liquid gold. I'm always wasting on, you know, buying more bags so I can, uh, you know, like uh, fill my inventory with even more crap, right? You know, that's what I, I like to do. Opening IDs right? directly without opening them. Yeah, exactly. Just like nuke that, okay, salvage it, boom, 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 get it done, right? All, All right. that kind of so good I, stuff. I was actually having this on stream yesterday because I, I used you as an example. Yeah. Um, do you, I'm lazy. You're, so. You said you wanted to do it because you didn't want to have to deal with like opening them, all that stuff. Do you know that you would actually get more gold by, um, it would be less gold or it'd be more gold, less hassle if you just instant sold those unIDs to the training post? Yeah, you mentioned this orders. last time. I mean, I, I have to say, I do have a bit of, I do have a bit of TP PTSD to be honest, because I, I was like, oh God, it's going to take 10 years to open. Like the sell order is going to be slow there as well. Uh, but yeah, no, there, there, I, I am not a particularly, um, efficient player like i mean well, not not in that regard is, anyway what you're doing when you're salvaging it so yeah you don't see that unid in your inventory anymore but you're getting all the materials from it so now if you want to clear out those those materials you now have to sell them on the training post anyways so you're going to the training post anyways for this if i'm you just, just putting it off i'm putting it off man okay, yeah. i'm delaying but it <laughs> if you just sold those unids <laughs> directly to the training post um because because unids are usually over grains at least are they're usually one copper par from uh buy and sell you can just instant sell it to it you're and you'll get more than you salvage it because when you salvage an unid as an unid you can only get the equivalent of a masterwork salvage out of it so when you open them you could get rares you could get exotics all right so but then you have to deal with opening them you have to deal with salvaging the greens you have to deal with doing what you do with the rarest and exotics but that's why you are just salvaging the directly you don't want to deal with that if you just instant sell them on the training post to whoever is buying them you don't have to deal with the materials that come out of it you don't have to deal with salvaging them you could just sell them and you'd get the gold right away in your tp pickup and you'll it's more gold than you would have gotten by salvaging the unids directly it's a huge loss to um like salvaging unids directly is really really close to just selling them to the vendor so well, you go, if you just sell them on the trading post you'll make more gold and you don't have to deal with the hassle of um of of like dealing with all the materials afterwards so that that's a case where it's like you're doing it because you're lazy but what you're actually doing is causing more work for yourself and losing gold you're getting the worst of both worlds oh my goodness well that's not good and this uh, okay this definitely um look kind of leads into this here uh, and this topic is one that I really wanted to cover, actually, uh, is the concept of how gold is actually generated or, or not necessarily how gold is generated, but how you guys generate gold and like how the shrewd 
economist or shrewd trader or person who understands how the game's economy actually works uh, generates money. Because we even saw this. Um, I saw this in chat. I wanted to respond to it. I was kind of waiting to respond until now, really. Uh, it was, people was like, but wait, if I do this, then the game stops being about playing the game. It becomes about spreadsheets and analysis and, you know, like all this boring stuff, right? Because again, like this does go into this perception that a lot of people think you guys are just like printing money, right? You're just like, yeah, I'm just like going crazy. I'm, you know, I'm doing like a flip. I'm buying low. I'm selling high. I'm bam, I've doubled my gold. But uh, what I really want to express to a lot of the, uh, the viewers here is that all you guys are doing is doing essentially simple things right, where a little bit of gold is generated and then just doing that on a massive scale with a, a lot of analysis and deciding what's the correct one to do. And the great example is the unidentified stuff here, right? Because obviously where the money's coming from there is people can't be bothered to open them, essentially. Would that be a fair thing to say, right? Like the money is, yeah. is because people don't want to do that work. And what you guys are doing, or this is something that I, I believe uh, you do a fair bit of Enco, right? Like with unidentified items and obviously other items like the salvage items that, you know, <laughs> we've now ruined uh, after talking about it on stream a little bit. Like it's yeah, essentially, too yeah, easy. yeah. Like, you know, people can't be bothered to do that. So what you're doing is you're taking some of your time using that and, and basically completing a lot of these little bits of uh, work very, very quickly using essentially like automation because you can salvage all, craft all with a really big inventory, right? And you're using your yeah. inventory space uh, optimized characters uh, and semi-automation, right? To do a lot of that work very, very, very quickly that other people can't be bothered to do essentially. And that's where a big amount of wealth is actually generated um, in a lot of these things that um, a lot of barons may use. Some of these methods will be used there. Is essentially you're doing work that other people can't be bothered to do. In the same way, right, that when, you know, for example, if you insta-sell, right, like, you know, uh, in, you know, uh, you know I, I'm someone who, I, I don't, you know, I can't be bothered, right? I'm, I just like, boom, sell it, give me my gold, let's go, right? You know, go. But essentially what that's doing is, is that is making money for someone who can be patient, right? Is what that is, right? And that's how a lot yeah. of these things work, is that low so effort like players kind of power the whole machine. To address so like, the... You know, and... Actually, do you want to... Actually, you could go ahead. Well, to to address the idea that oh, I, I don't I want to actually play the game. I don't want to turn this into spreadsheets. Um, for those of you, well, let me put this back off. Um, the thing is with that though is a lot of times people always complain that hey, you know, I don't have gold to go go buy whatever I need. I need to go farm. So how much time are you spending farming versus doing stuff you'd rather be doing? Like I do the trading post, so I don't have to worry about gold. So I can like do raids all like all day, every day, refractors all day, every day. And I don't have to worry about it. So I, I get to play what I actually enjoy doing in the game instead of farming, which I hate. I hate farming. So a lot of it is more just like, well, if you enjoy farming, go for it. I mean, I rather do raids when I'm playing the game. And then I like doing spreadsheets. So I'm having fun either way. Uh, but I would rather be doing stuff in game and not have to worry about gold. So that's that's like it, it kind of is like if you like farming, then fine, do whatever. But for, I, I think for the most people, most people farm uh, because they feel it's a necessity to get what they want. Yeah, would you I guys disagree with that statement? No, I, I completely agree with this, and and I think this is this is a, a really weird thing, and and, it, and it, with not with everyone, I want to be clear, but I think that the the interaction there and the conversation there, exactly what you're describing, Enco, it kind of betrays people's actual motives. They want something for nothing, right? They want mm -hmm. the get rich yeah. instantly scheme is what players actually want, because the thing is, is that doing all this stuff, right? You're putting in effort. Right. Obviously, you're doing it very efficiently and you're certainly putting in less hours in terms of actual right. I am now making gold right than someone who's farming a lot. But, you know, it is a lot of it is still effort in deciding what to do. And, you know, you have to actually crunch the items right, or do whatever you want to do. If, you, if that's trading legendaries, if it's, uh, you know, being patient, waiting for buy orders to fill and then making items with that or doing whatever you're doing to, to kind of skim some off the top, essentially, from other people's laziness. Um, there's still effort there. And I think a lot of players think that you guys aren't putting any effort in, whereas in reality, you're just being very efficient with the effort that you're putting in. Right. Would that be a fair statement to make? Yes. Uh, I mean, early on, it's, I mean, now I would say maybe it's way less effort, but that's because now, like, there is a lot that has been generated, right? Like, whatever I had to do or Enko had to do early on was a lot more than what we are at today. The reason why Enko can continue doing what he does now is because 
he's gone through all the hassle of collecting data and so uh Anko X, for example has like almost drop rates for anything that he's interested in right so like he knows for example if he puts in uh this many uh rares or exotics into the forge this is how many times like this is how much on average he'll get a precursor every time he throws this amount this amount right um for me for example i don't like that type of stuff like i'll use the spreadsheet to get an understanding of what i, what I want to make out of this item but i might not necessarily continue putting data but you still need to put the effort in to know what you're making money on like there's yeah like it's boring but like if you enjoy it then you won't find it boring so like Enko, myself, or any other person that has that passion to keep doing this trading and, and still do what you want to do in the game. Like, it's just, if you like it, do it. But if you don't like it, uh, don't do it if you don't like it. Like, you're not going to enjoy it. If you don't like spreadsheets, if you don't like uh, figuring out why, like, this tab on this spreadsheet is not linking to my other spreadsheet or, like, all the hassles of figuring out where your code went wrong, like, that's maybe not something for you. Um so um like to go on like briefly like you said also as well like it takes a lot to generate all this gold yeah i mean in real life the more resources of income you have the more the, the richer you get right like if you get money from this job you get money from that job you may be in trade in stocks maybe there's a, a deal that you figured out or like a trade a passion and you make money out of that the more sources of income the richer you get it's the same in the game like um if you only do unidentified gear that's just one way of making money and that alone has its own problems right like you have to figure out the, the this investment how much you have to put in you have to figure out like how much data to kind of get an idea how much do i actually make right what's my return how much profit do i make out of units right you need to figure out first of all how much are you making um and that's just one side then you have refining which is like literally you you have a lot of materials you refine them into their higher tier and list them on a trading post or maybe you're like okay i'm gonna search up like mithril ingots for example right now uh what what items can i use this and craft with and then sell that item on the trading post right it's just that stuff like takes two three hours but it's no different than like i put five hours into a, a golem for raid training except i'm doing that specifically for trades or um, just say you know d you know doing open world metas or something like that or you know like it, it's it's, it's open world it, metas, you're yeah, you're like, putting in hours and you're generating out profit right uh, is essentially what's going on there, right you know like research actually crafting the items right like waiting for the buy orders to fill right like waiting for sell orders to fill there as well right like you're just all of this essentially boils down to a different way of playing the game right a different way of of doing an activity that produces profit and it just so happens that as, well exactly as you'd expect right it's going to be the most efficient right like actually directly interfacing with the economy is exactly what you'd expect to be the most profitable thing in the game, right? Uh, and yeah. that's exactly what it is. And, and the thing people need to remember too is like, if you're doing like basic things like flipping, um, we're talking about investment in the game. So people are saying like, hey, I'd rather be playing the game. Well, the flipping and a lot of other uh, training posts, things like the stuff I do is a little more active, um, mm. but a lot of the stuff when you're doing flipping, for instance, you put in buy orders. And it, it's not like you're sitting there watching the training post window and waiting for buyers to come in. You put in buyers for 20 items and then you go do whatever else you want and then you, you come check back in like three or four hours and then you pick up the items that 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 you got that people sold to you and then you list them you're not you're not sitting there watching the trading post waiting for your item to sell you know the thing is like uh you know uh paint drying like what's that saying about watching paint drying paint dry, yeah. Like, yeah 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 exactly. uh, it, so the thing is like you're not doing that it, it's nobody I, I really hope nobody's doing this it's just like i like you don't put in a buy order and then just sit there watching the training post. You put in a buy order and then you go do raids. You go do fractals. You go do whatever else you want. You go play with your friends or something like that. And then you come back and then you go pick up the stuff and then you do whatever you're doing with that stuff. And then you put it back in the training post and you go back to playing the game again. So if you get if you if you get used to doing this, the amount of time you're actually spending on the training post is actually very very little. Like when I'm playing the game, I spend very little time on the training post because like refining you know, and then talked about that uh if i'm refining for 40, 40 mithril ore i don't sit there and watch it like before i go to sleep i'll hit refine all and then when i wake up it's all refined how much time did i have to spend doing it my account was refining but how much time did i spend doing anything i didn't so a lot of it is just finding efficient ways it's like hey if, like how much of this stuff like refining you could do all that stuff afk 
You just hit refine, then you leave. A lot of other people, I see like, like, well, a lot of people don't like refining, so they just never do it. They just sell the raw mithril ore. But you can you could do a lot of the stuff when you're like not at your computer, refining especially, and then you can you can sell it. Buying, yeah, I mean, buy if you also aren't gonna those, do this while you're sleeping, you like if that. you're gonna refine, um, like if you're gonna go sleep, you can go sleep. But like if if you're refining, say, and like it's the middle of the day in the weekend, and you're not, you don't want to actually just stay watching it, but you still want to be on the computer. Open up Netflix or something, and then just like watch Netflix while you see in yep. your game, like pro I, just, do something, right? You're not gonna actually sit there and literally spend five, six hours. Like your five, six hours is gonna happen once, and then like maybe every now and then you might have to do some research. But like majority of the time, ninety percent of the time, if you finally got the hang of it, like again, you're just gonna spend maybe half an hour putting in orders in, or maybe even not even half an hour, like ten minutes, by the way. Like and then, like Enko said, go play raids or fractals or world vs world or pvp right do what would do what you're gonna do anyway and then come back like or check on it like maybe an hour later and be like oh okay my order is filled collect the stuff do what you want to do with it and then list it right and then go do again what you're playing or something and then when you log off uh make sure you before you log off you list the stuff so that when you're sleeping it sells overnight so you, when you come back in the morning, you have the gold already there. Uh, but you haven't really spent five hours of the game just doing this. You've, exactly. Like Enko said, yeah. like you've maybe spent a collective of maybe 40 minutes of actual sitting down and doing this stuff. And the other three hours was actually, or four hours was playing the game, right? So. And I, exactly. And just to very quickly clarify, guys, like you, this is not botting. Like, you know, there is literally a craft all button in the game, right? It's literally in the game. Uh, you're completely allowed to use that. There's nothing wrong with doing that in any way. And yeah, as MM says, even if you do want to still be in attendance of your computer, um, not that it would really make any difference in, in ArenaNet's eyes, right? Yeah, you can just like, you know, just do something else, right? You, I mean, you, if you wanted to, you could even be multiboxing, right? You know, you could, you know, you could have one account crafting and you could be playing on another one, right? While you're waiting, right? You know, if you wanted to do that, you could have, say, an account uh, you know, you could have, you could be crafting on, say, your alt account, or on your main, you could be playing raids or something like that, right? Or, or doing whatever you want to do. Uh, and again, that would be completely okay um, to do that. There's no, no like illegality here whatsoever. Of course not. Yeah. The only restriction when you're refining is that you can't move your character. Yeah. Which, like, if they added, imagine this, they added a uh, permanent crafting access passes, like the bank access and stuff like that, mm. so I can open the crafting window wherever I want. If, if that allowed me to refine while I was moving, I would just go do raids and ref, and like have the crafting window up on the side refining mithril while I'm doing raids. I would just do that. Mm -hmm. But because we have to be at a crafting thing, the only thing I could do while I'm waiting for all this mithril to refine is, you know, trading post stuff, watch TV, whatever, or I could just refine all and like go AFK. Uh, so one thing I really want to ask him is what do we mean when we say flipping, because I think the big community perception is, is flipping is right. I'm going to buy low and I'm going to sell high. But I think that's, it's actually a little, right. it's a little bit more complicated than that though. I nope, believe. That's it. Right. But like, I don't anyway, do flipping. I, I hate flipping. Yeah. But when it, when it comes to flipping though, I, I think there was like a certain level of implication that you might buy materials low and then sell the product high. Okay, Would so that, here's, that's not uh, flipping, that's prospecting. I want to make yeah. two, dif two differentiations, all right? Because I think mm. people mix uh, this and another thing. So flipping and investing aren't the same thing. Uh, I, I feel like I've seen people use that yeah. on a YouTube guide before where they'd be like, flipping and investing is the, you know, it's the same thing. You're buying low, selling high. Flipping is buy low, sell high in a short span of time, typically a day. But maybe you could, def by definition wise, maybe you could stretch it to a week, but no more than that. Investing is I buy an item today to speculate it will grow up in value three months from now or a month from yeah. now. There's a difference sure. between flipping and investing. And I just want to get that clear because I've seen a certain instrument use that on their YouTube videos and it's very wrong. So can so, we go over oh. just some to the terms then? Just oh, so yeah. We, like, that, really that, everyone's on the same page? That'll be fantastic. Okay, so, so flipping. Flipping is I put a buy order in, it, fi it fills, I immediately turn around and I list back the trading post. So you're... You're looking at the price of an item, the buy order, and then you're looking at the price that you can list it for, and then you take into account the taxes, and you're getting more uh, back after you sell it than you spent. And that's just like, I buy it, I immediately list it. That's buy low, mm. sell high, it's flipping. Uh, when we're talking about investing, it's usually it's like, I'm going to buy a bunch of this item because I am expecting the price to go up. 
So right now, I, I can't just list it right because it's not profitable, but in three months, um, then it will be worth coming more. up in the game. Yeah. We have a festival coming up. Oh, drawer breakers might be more profitable during uh during that that festival. Why well, can't I remember what that festival is called? It's the one in uh in Holbrook. Um but so if I buy them Dragon Bash, there you go. So if I buy them now, because they're kind of they're cheaper right now, and then demand goes up later on, I'm investing in that product where it's gonna go up. So speculating is something a little different. Speculating is more um I'm gonna buy up into this item because Okay, so investing is like, hey, this is going to go up because we know this festival's coming. We know that this demand's going to increase. Symbols of control. You buy them now, you're investing in that. They're going to go up because Legend Armory is going to increase demand for Legendary Sigils. So therefore, the price of Symbols of Control are going to go up. It should be a good buy. That's investing. Speculating is going to be is, I'm going to buy this and I think something might happen. But you're you're basically gambling on... A net changing something in the game, mm. or another, or somehow demand goes up on an item, but you don't really have anything. On it. That, that's why it's speculation. You're guessing. Okay, it's a little more. It's closer to a long-term gamble than it is. Investing is usually because you know something's going to go up. Um, yeah. Flipping is I'm just buying it and I'm immediately selling it. So yeah. th those are the three different things. Yeah, there okay? are. You got yeah. processing, which are change. You're buying stuff to yeah. convert it into other things, and you know you're processing. Because because obviously, right, there are a lot of trends within the game, right? I I think I don't know if this is still. A really big, uh, really big case because I think the supply is absolutely massive now. I guess, but certainly something that would used to happen, right, is you would see the price fluctuate in like trick or treat bags, right, like or, or like Winter's Day gifts over the year. Like there, there are trends that you can observe, right? Um, you know, like when when things happen, and again, the speculation or rather the investment is, you know, like when Legendary Armory comes out. Oh, guess what? People are going to probably want to craft Legendary, or like oh. There are Gen 3 weapons. I guess Gen 3 would be an example of speculation, right? Because, like, ArenaNet might, like, nuke Mystic Coins in yeah. some way, right? Like, for example, <laughs> we don't know how they're right? Be. Yeah, like, what's going on there, right? You know, you can kind of make a gamble. So I think that's a really great explanation there as well. But, like, on, on the uh, the flip, I think flipping, this is, like, the contentious one that I, I want to talk about. Like, this is, like, the big meme, right? That um, I think a lot of people perceive flipping to be the, like, main source of a Baron's wealth. No. How much... No. Of you, like the big stuff, we're talking like million gold value. How much are you guys making from flipping? Obviously, Enka, you said you don't flip, but MM, 0%. like, uh, yeah, I yeah. Zero I make gold. like, okay, um, maybe 10% or 5% mm. of my, uh, uh, I would say, uh, day or monthly uh, profits comes from flipping. It's not mm. that much. Uh, As I understand no. it, like it, it, flipping might be something that you might do a little bit more small scale, right? Like this is something yes. we talked about last time. It's like you might use that to build up some initial capital to then do something else with. Yeah. So it used to be much more worth your time. And this is because of the early time of the game. So back then, yes, it was not bad. You could actually flip uh, because, again, there was not much supply of many of these things. So you could technically, you know, buy something at this price right now, list it five, six hours later before you go to sleep. Um, and it would sell and uh, someone was saying like, yeah, like, or I think it was Nike. It was like, yeah, like at that point, it would have probably passed up 15% of the tax that you could make some sort of profit on it. Not so much now, which is why you have more things like processing items, crafting, refining, um, trying, you know, getting something. And as Enko puts it, like you buy stuff, do stuff to stuff, and then you sell stuff. That's becoming more and more mm -hmm. common because... Flipping is just not uh, is not just not uh, uh, efficient anymore. And then of course there's player to player trading, and then whatever other methods that you can find out. So you, it's it's very little compared to what it used to be. Okay, uh, and uh, kind of on that thing there as well with regards to um, with regards to flipping, right? Like I know, obviously there are certain items that you're going to flip more. What would be like a good example of an item that a player might flip? Because I believe I believe uh, MM like wasn't your start on something like onions and carrots or something like that? I believe like on the on the trade on the trading post. Um, so the story about that is, um, you guys remember like the first player in the game? They uh, they got to level eighty by crafting. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody knew like in in the beta of the game. If you tried out the game in in the early months, you could actually get to level eighty just by crafting. So the first person, I think it was a French player, or I don't remember their like. I remember like they even touted their nationality. Uh, they got there to level eighty within the first week. So what did I do? I bought carrots and onions, like, and used that because people were gonna start using chef and other stuff. So I I made money off that, and then slowly was able to generate gold get into the other crafting disciplines and then I, I milked that until it was not profitable for a few months um and then tried to figure out other ways 
Uh, but yeah, I mean, I actually started off with carrots and onions. Well, there you go. Uh, and they're going to go on the flipping thing again, because I think this is something that we should really look to try and correct. Uh, because, you know, we've been saying it like Enco, 0%, Souls in chat, 0%, MM, 5 to 10%. Are there any uh, ultra high value players, ultra high account value players who actually do a lot of trading, or rather a lot of their profits from flipping, or is it uh, from other things? Asiano, he was the only one that I knew that did high end flipping. And then that was because he got into it with gold from other sources if fusion yeah. is not like really your bl on like if you buy like if you're actually making think of it like this um you buy uh a chalk right for 17k and let's just go back to like 2018 when this was actually working you buy a chalk for 17k um christmas uh you buy it at 17k only in four wins right so say christmas six months later mm -hmm. people are getting gifts for their for their loved ones or something right or people are just generous <laughs> Uh, the chalk all of a sudden is worth more because it's been six months of out of four wins and it's been enough time where people have circulated them and are holding on to them. Uh, so you sell it for 21, 22k, made maybe anywhere from four to 5k profit. Um, but that investment took you six months to make. Yeah. So that's not like, really flipping. It, it, yeah. <laughs> High end that flipping time, um, yeah. has longer yeah. terms, yes. But, yeah. In, in that time, like you could have made that, you, you could have used that 17k much more efficiently to make i don't know quadruple more than that 10 times more than the profit that you would have made just from the chalk so if if you can do it sure but it's i wouldn't advise someone who has fifty thousand gold to buy a chalk and flip it like there's so many more things you could do with fifty thousand gold than buying 10 infusions and hoping they go up in price six months later Okay, so uh, on that then, you know, the, the elephant in the room then, the big question is that obviously, uh, you know, Enko is obviously very transparent about how he makes his wealth, right? It is a lot of it, as I understand it, it would it be fair to say a lot of it is in the processing aspect uh, of the economy uh, there as well? 100% um, of the gold I have made in this game has been from processing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, it's, and what you need to do when you are going that route, you need to know the drop rates of things. So mm -hmm. you were talking when we were talking yeah, on Thursday. <laughs> the, the, um, the, uh, what was it? What was it? The pelts, I believe? We were... No, no, no. So heavy multi bags. So <laughs> ah, you were talking yeah. when you did that like three yeah. in, right? Yeah. That was one of the first big things I did. Oh, um, because oh, heavy great multi bags. Yeah, that's good. You can, well, so early on in the game, heavy multi bags mm. were like 60 copper each. Mm. You could put a buy order in of like 50,000 of them, and they would all come in within like an hour. Yeah, because of the, all okay, the ore farming, right? There's a huge amount of ore farming going on at the time. Because that, that was like the main farm. In the yeah. Everybody was, ore, was mm. farming in a raw. Um, and then if you open these though, so everybody, nobody wanted to open them, and then like, because they just want to go back to farming. They thought farming was more fun, and they thought they were being more gold doing that. But if you opened that heavy moldy bag, you paid 60 copper for it. The stuff that came out of it, you could sell it for four silver. So it was it was like 600% profit. <laughs> so it was it was ridiculous. And you got them in high quantities too. So mm. my first, uh, I think my first 50,000 account value gain in this game was through heavy moldy bags. Um, yeah. But the big difference though was that I was also tracking everything that came out of it. So I can I knew what the drop rates were of every individual item that came out. So that way, if the prices on heavy multi bags went up, like let's say it went to two silver, I could actually still tell like, hey, is this still profitable for me to buy? So for me, the the real gain in value is not the gold I made. It's the 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 value is in knowing what the drop rates of the items are. Because then I I you know I can make a spreadsheet that here's all the stuff I got out of it. Uh, I link it to the TP and here's all the stuff. Here's all the prices that they are. Um, and then it'll calculate it out. It's like, okay, here's the break point if like when you shouldn't buy mm. it anymore. Yeah. And that's just how I think for any item. Back yeah. then, we didn't have the API stuff we did now. I had to do this all manually. I would go to the training post every day and it's like, oh, in bloods were, were like 80 silver or 80 copper. Let's type that in. And I would just fill out the spreadsheet like that. Now, most of it, the spreadsheet's mostly automated. Yeah that, yeah, that is exactly what, what I did there as well. I, I actually had a little little uh, program that was doing it for me because, you know, spreadsheets scare me. 
Uh, but yeah, that was exactly what what I did to make Incinerator, right? I was like, oh god, it was, you know, it, it got to. The, <laughs> I mean, obviously, this was the, the. You know what the main issue I always remember was with heavy moldy bags is that I would open them all, right, and I would, I would like nuke down to like three frames a second, right, because of the way the UI loads. I, I'm not sure it does this now actually, but the way it used to be is that whenever you would open a bag, even if it wasn't rendering the item you got out of the bag, it would still load the icon. So the more bags you would open, the lower your frame rate would get to the point where I would. Would actually be on like three fps after opening like a full inventory of heavy moldy bags right that was uh some good times uh right there as well um, so we know what happened there and we, and we know that you know this is basically just a very analytical data-driven approach right uh to obtaining wealth uh, from these items that that's processing like opening things right salvaging things whatever so mm right you don't have to say exactly what, because, uh, you know, as an example, guys, we were talking about this um, on the last stream about this week, and we were talking about, Enko gave us an example of ripped pelts, I believe, were a profitable item if you buy them, at, you know, at a buy order, and then you salvage them and then sell the materials. Now, obviously, guys, you're not going to get examples here, to be clear, because, well, uh, it turns out that not only ripped pelts got demolished, but, like, every other salvage item got demolished. And bear in mind, guys, we were only on stream at that point for, I believe, like, uh, you know, like, I believe, like, 800 people... 900 people and that like annihilated it right as everyone like, started piling in going crazy but mm what what's the secret what what kind of activities are you doing to generate your wealth then i mean mostly it's refining and units and player to player trading mm. um or flipping i probably did that for about four years ish of the game 2012 to around 20 uh 15 16, 16 i'd say like i i started like Chasing out, flipping entirely. Um, but most of it was actually the same. Like, I, I'd get a, a lot of materials, I would refine them, figure out recipes to do them, and things like that. Um, and then I came about uh, an interesting thing in 2015. Uh, so I found that, like, I had never actually, this is a fact, I've never made a legendary weapon in this game um, myself. Like, I've always bought someone's gift of mastery to make a weapon. So, what did I do uh, while I was refining, crafting, and still flipping? Um, I found out I, I wanted to make a weapon, right? So the first weapon I bought was the Dreamer. Um, I actually just bought it off the trading post for a thousand gold. Um, in 2015, I wanted to make more weapons, more Gen ones, which I, I didn't have really the interest of world comp. Like I would mainly be in World vs World or you know playing whatever at that point was just dungeons in the game. Um, so I asked someone, uh, hey, like, can I uh, buy your gift of mastery? Can I just send you items, make the weapon for me, send it back? Uh, and he's like, sure. Uh, and he did that. The first one worked well. Like, it was someone I trusted. So obviously, I didn't send it to anyone that I didn't know. Um, and then uh, I did another one. Uh, but then this one, like, it was, I think, the Ministrel or something. I didn't ah, really want the weapon. Excellent choice. So, like, yeah, but I mean, I sold it. Like, I, I, I wasn't going to use it at the time. It was a nice weapon, but I wasn't going to use it. So I sold it. Um, and I was like, actually, what, what's the profit on that? Uh, so I calculated it. And this was at the time where weapons were still fairly, uh, you know, expensive. Like 3,000 gold, 3,300, right? 3,400 for Bifrost and your Twilights and Sunrises. So I put the math together and figured out that bottleneck to make a weapon is the spirit shards right and the mystic coins uh which at the time were actually were cheap it was just that you have to gamble them in a way for the mystic clover so i was like okay uh i don't have spirit shards because i don't maybe farm enough to get them uh mystic coins are somewhat manageable at that time they were still very very cheap um but spirit shards requires you to play a lot so i was like okay i tallied it up and at that point was uh, about 400 to 500 gold profit a weapon um and this was a lot for me to do like because it was like in 2015 i was maybe only worth 50,000 60,000 gold um and for me to put money into making a weapon which costs you you know 1,800 2,000 gold at that point to make a weapon a lot of gold to spend so i i started doing it slowly uh, and i first month maybe made four weapons five weapons while still making sure i made money on the side from crafting and refining and you know checking out like any other bags that i could open and make money out of the materials uh because in case this failed i would have still had my other my other thing um and then i did it to the point where i was like actually you could scale this up so i scaled it up slowly over time and i went to making 30 40 weapons a month 
Um, and I was also funding Jade Corio because I was like their funder. So I made deals with guilds and I was like, I'll buy your guild to come to my server. You fight for my server, right? And at that time, I want your players to sell me all their spirit shards. Um, so I told them, I need you to make me T6 weapons to keep funding these weapons. So I would give them T5 mats. I would tell them, convert the mats to T6, send me the T6, I'll pay you for your service. So I'd pay... Uh, 50 gold, 40 gold, 30 gold, 60 gold. Like, I, it was very difficult because, like, at the time, it wasn't really... People weren't really doing it much, so it was hard to really say what's the price. But I just did that enough times till it actually scaled up and actually started overtaking my, my flipping and my crafting and refining for a while. Uh, now I do mostly... Well, not mostly, but I do units to supplement a lot. But, like, back then, the legendary market actually ended up becoming my main source of income. So I would talk to like three, four hundred players like on three, four month basis and make that many weapons, sell them. Uh, and then I found out Zushin and another like another player who's a commander in Maguma was kind of trying to do the same thing, but didn't have the capital and he needed it mostly for guilds on his server. So I was like, OK, I'll give you the, the weapons up front, um, but your server has to play for my server. So like Maguma would basically be like uh, JQ's bitch, basically. Okay, that's that's basically what they were. <laughs> Maguma was JQ's bitch. I paid Zushin and I told him do whatever you need to do to keep JQ in T1. All right, so uh, I basically did that for a while, and then it eventually more people got into it. Even Souls, actually, I found Souls as someone who was selling me four or five Gift of Masteries, and then at some point he was like, uh, "I can actually make more money doing this myself." And I was like, "I mean, yeah, but like." You kind of need to do other stuff because you, you can't just keep making money with weapons. You need like, you need a lot of gold. To make two, 20, 30 weapons means you need 50, 60k a month to burn, assuming you can even sell all the weapons every day, right? Because you can't. Only 5 to 10 sell a day. Um, so Souls ended up then getting into money making like that. That's how I actually found him and got him into the TP guild. Um, and yeah, more and more people know about it now and even with the podcast with Wooden Potatoes that you can yeah, that do happened. this. But... And then you manipulated yeah. the entire player base into farming spirit shards for you. No longer content with a mere 300 players. In fact, thousands of players now farming spirit shards. Okay. Uh... <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, so like I, I, over time, it just became less and less profitable. So like over time, you just phase it out because uh, I think this was also one of the perceptions people... Uh, have in the uh, William Potatoes podcast like it's like oh yeah if I make a weapon that, that's the end game and it's like no we were just showing an idea of a process and mostly like just to you know tell people like you can do this if you have a gift of mastery right you can can do it like but if you want to make money on legendary weapons today you need to make 50 60 a month which means you need to have 30 40 K just to burn to make these weapons and there's actually way more way more efficient ways for you to get weapons by trading ectos by trading materials by trading uh, other items so if you ever ever thought like you can make gift of masteries and that's how you get rich maybe like six years ago or five years ago when it wasn't a thing but after 2017 not so much like it it's there's more ways again like it's the same with flipping there's more ways for infusion flipping sorry there's more ways to make money efficiently than putting it into a weapon so again, the, um, the insight there, though, is that essentially you are, in that transaction, you are taking um, a service and also account-bound and semi-time-gated stuff. For example, like Spirit Shards, right? There's, you know, you, you have to, you know, grind XP, essentially, right, to get Spirit Shards. I mean, there's a lot more of them now about the place, but, you know, like, you, know, that, you, know you have to grind that to obtain those items um, yeah, or that currency. I mean and, you know, again, Gift of Mastery, you are turning... Uh, map completion in, in a part of that, right? Into into gold, right? You are doing something for someone else, right? You are performing a service and then, uh, you know, you're, extra, you're turning that into gold. Like the key insight here is that a lot of this stuff is, again, like something that it, other players might have difficulty obtaining or would have to uh, uh, put effort into obtaining. And again, making that efficient, doing that on a large scale and then uh, making profit off the back of that, I mean, right? Now, for example... Um... Let's say since twenty late twenty nineteen, like had not really been doing much uh, in in gift of mastery trading, just simply because like it's it's just a lot of work for very little when stuff like units is out where you can just process the materials at a 
uh, you could basically obtain the materials at a much cheaper rate and you're gonna make more money for i guess more work but like it like it's more worth your time so with weapons it was kind of headache free um but in a way it was also very stressful because you're dealing with like 30 40 players a month potentially right mm. like that's 30 40 players that can scam you at any moment in time and so yeah like I, I, i'm <laughs> and, and the, the other thing here as well is right is that um, would you say that the profit there is actually reliant on direct player-to-player -player interaction? Because obviously you're, a, a part of that is that you're also essentially double, yeah, dodging the fees. Because in a way, if you dodge the fees, it allows both parties to win, right? In a way, right? Like, you know, because you, yeah. can, you, can you can sell the item for a high price, but you can still buy it for a lower price than you would otherwise get it on the trading post, right? For example, you know, with yeah, the, so early, with the early on, like, yeah, you could have made four or five hundred gold even after selling the weapon on the trading post. That mm. was possible early on, 2015, 2016. Uh, 2017, it actually starts to drop because 2017, by that point, there had been enough people to kind of say there is a trading community large enough to who have probably heard of this and started doing it. Um, some of them even did it like just because it was something that other, like, you know, like four or five people were actually doing on a massive scale and people were like, oh, yeah, I'll do five weapons a month. And they're like, oh, how come my profit is not that large? And it's like, well, you're only doing five weapons a month. We're doing 50 weapons a month, like, and, and still doing other stuff. So um, later, yeah, it became player to player trading. You would avoid the taxes because of player to player trading. Like I'd make a weapon. I go to a supplier. I'd be like, this weapon equals five T6 sets. Those five T6 sets give me enough to make another five weapons. Like, you know, you'd work out a price that you have to bargain your price with them and things like that. But yeah, you could scale up slowly like that. Um, but you, I mean, people say like you can avoid the tax, like uh, the TP tax. Uh, not really, because um, eventually, like I call this like a a circle, right? Like eventually uh, the circle ends with you selling back to the trading post. You, you can try to do as many trades as you can to avoid uh, the trading post. Eventually, you're going to need some form of raw gold to kind of put in buy orders for something that you might need or... To kind of just have uh like raw gold in your account so um it depends what you do with what you have and eventually maybe yeah you can maybe skip the trading post with five to six player trades maybe some people go 12 trades with players before they ever go to the trading post but i think like eventually you have to go to the trading post you really can't avoid the trading post in the game um because that's the only place in the game where you can get more than 500 gold without being capped right like that's it's just a fact like you're not going to be able to get 500k or sorry 500 gold uh other than maybe having i don't know 100 accounts to send 500 gold to so well i mean that, I, I suppose that does depend to a certain extent right unless you actually want to say buy gems surely you could just continuously trade items right if you wanted every legendary in the game you could build up a lot of wealth in items and then trade those items for other items no if you really wanted to I mean, the only thing you could, would, the only yeah. thing you would like, could but, absolutely uh, need gold for would essentially be gems and, so, and a few other unique things, I guess. So the entire loop started with MM getting T5s and getting those people to upgrade those and like using their spirit shards. So he would eventually need to put buy orders in for T5s, like at the start of the chain. You would need gold to buy the T5s to start the thing to give to other people for T6s. Yeah, sure. And then you you would also need gold to pay people for the um the gifts of masteries. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the things that are doing this at some point, unless like unless at the end he takes that legendary and he trades it to somebody else for a lot of T five materials. <laughs> I, I've never heard of anybody buying with that. a legendary yeah. <laughs> with T five materials. Like the the number of mats you would have to trade for that. So chances are what you're going to end up doing is you're going to sell or trade that legendary for something that you could liquidate, like either Mystic Coin, something that you could turn into gold relatively easily. Legendaries suck for liquidating, which is why I don't like them, um, because you need that gold to buy the T5s unless you're, like maybe you trade a Legendary for 20,000 Winner's Day presents and those drop a lot of T5s or something like mm. that. At some point, you're going to need to get T5s to start the process over again. 
Hey, and, and actually, well, okay, so obviously this is no longer profitable. I think we've actually talked about this before, Emma, about the legendary market there as well. Yeah. Um, but like, what kind of thing are you up to these days? Like, uh, you know, like, uh, is it is it other like very high ticket items that you are trading no, between no, players actually, or I, like what, what's the I what's the majority? Units. Give me like the top. Give me like the top thing that like uh, you, uh, like what you I, do. To like get what I do value. now is like mostly units uh, crafting of. Uh, when I say crafting, I'm I'm talking about like upgrades and stuff like that, sigils, mm. runes um and like any other refinement of a material or uh like rest like it's just very small stuff uh and then units is kind of i would say maybe 30 or 40 percent of what i do uh for ankle it's a lot higher because ankle uh uses a lot of the stuff uh, on a daily 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 basis but for me it's like maybe 30 40 percent and then maybe five percent maybe i find something that like i still have a few items that i invest in every day uh, or not invest like i flip every day like they, they've been very consistent and the gold is not that bad but like you know it, it could be better but like it's still five percent of what i make on a monthly basis um so i do that and then yeah that's it like i'll maybe try and use the materials that i use to trade for weapons or stuff like that but gums i've been out of that for like a, a year uh souls at some point in 20 late 2019 actually souls became like the largest uh, gift of mastery buyer uh it used to be me for like four years but then souls Kind of already taken that by now uh i don't know if he still does it but like i haven't been that active with comms just because i don't have time and uh yeah like it's, it's just too much headache so if i do it now like i only do it through referrals like i will for example tell you uh all right you want to give me you want to sell me 10 goms sell me 10 successful goms get five friends two friends i don't know however many friends you can take to sell me 10 successful goms every 10 successful gom purchases i will give you a legendary weapon um, and I'm essentially paying you a finder's fee for like 150 to 200 gold, by the way, per person. So it's not profitable, but the incentive is that you have to go work for me and get me, you know, goms for me to make the weapons. Um, and I supplement the profits I make from other stuff to basically afford to pay you out this fee. Um, so like I'll have like three, four people if I ever want to say one round a month be like, uh, okay, I want, I want to do some like 30, 40 weapons today or this month. This month I want to do 30, 40 weapons. I will go to three, four people and tell them, you give me 10 goms, you go find me 10 goms, you go get 10 people with 10 goms, uh, or find out who it is that you can get 10 goms out of. Uh, and then every 10 goms, I'll pay you a weapon. Um, uh, just to clarify, right? gift of mastery, guys. Gift of mastery. The, it's essentially, you know, the, the thing you used to make legendaries. There you go, gen ones. I mean, it, I mean, I, I would say like, imagine like basically finding 10 of your friends to sell someone the gifts of mastery is just for you to receive a weapon. That's the laziest form of money making I've ever heard. Because all you have to do is basically find me friends that you trust enough to send me the, the weapon back, right? So, like, it's not really that... It Guys, it's not a it's scam. The laziest way. Also. It's not, it's guys. Not a it's, scam. it's not. Like, you're, guys, you're getting paid. You're, you're to paying do people you're getting paid. to play the game, dude. This is guys, okay, this is this is capitalism, guys. Okay, it's capitalism in action. Like uh, MM is paying someone to do a service. In this you know, case, it's like, like map completion. A pyramid scheme oh. would would imply that like yeah. oh, you have to God. like basically then sell the item. Like the pyramid scheme would be like, I give you all this materials, go sell it, and you know it's unsellable. That's what a pyramid scheme is. What I'm doing is like I'm basically just giving you a commission. Get me he's 10 just doing referrals you... now because yeah, like I'm, like, I'm paying you a commission. It's like if somebody came in uh -oh. and got you business and they get five percent of that commission. I'm giving you a weapon, right? And, and then, honestly, that's more than most of you will make. Uh, I'll stop there uh, yeah. before I get. I'm gonna I, get. I, I, whoa! <laughs> I find it so whoa. interesting, like the differences in like how we made gold because everything I did. So, yeah. MM has this like huge network. Like that's how this all started, right? He just networked a lot so that he, he like had people supplying gifts with masteries, right? For for me, it's like I didn't actually meet these guys until like 2017. <laughs> like I had no contact with anybody about trading post stuff except for Dan Days, because he was a friend from like from much earlier on. And like like everything MM does depended on other people of like contacting him doing all this stuff. None of my stuff depends on anybody except the trading post. So I just find it so interesting, like the differences in our approaches. It's actually that, really, it's actually kind of weird. Dude, okay, dude, the M in MM stands for mask off, boys. Holy shit. There we go. <laughs> actually exposed Baron there. But no, no, seriously, guys, like to, just to, just to clarify, this is essentially like how a lot of, um, 
you know, how, how like a, a scalable business works, right? Like essentially what's going on here is that MM has employees in the game. He's running a business, right? When he's doing this, he's saying, right, I'm going to pay you guys, um, you know, a, a, a fee to do something. In this case, it's gift of mastery. And then he takes that gift of mastery, turns it into a legendary weapon and then sells that at a profit. Like that's that's all that's going on. There's nothing like weird about that. Like he's not like he's he hasn't got like slaves doing this for him, right? He's not like saying, oh, you know, look, like, oh, you better do this, otherwise, you know, you better pay me that protection money, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, Maguma's gonna come for you, right? I don't know. Right. Think, think of it like <laughs> this. Uh, think of it like this. Uh, I mean, no, okay, with the whole uh, you know server politics stuff like aside in World vs. World. I mean, sure, like I maybe kind of manipulated in a sense World vs. World, but that wasn't just me, like. Think of it like this, how many guilds have stacked the server and manipulated the ser like the, the tiers, right? Like it's like it's not just with the gold, it's also with like the actual guilds who will stack a server. Um and yeah, like I mean the other people was like <laughs> they get paid for the gloms. I don't just like get the weapons and and I don't pay them. Like it, that's what a it's transaction like, is. is. The commission to guild the, well, the GLM. Let, let, let's, yeah. let, can, can, <laughs> let's just quickly do a real life example here, right? Suppose you work at a restaurant. Right? What what's going on at the restaurant, guys? Like you're working there to maybe cook the food. Let's you're the chef. You're a chef at a restaurant, guys. You're getting paid an hourly wage to cook this food, right? To you know to do this, right? But the restaurant owner is not like scamming the chef, right? The restaurant owner is paying for a service, right? Which they then use to generate a profit margin, right? Because they will then say, you know, you're you're at a restaurant, you make, you know. Nice little lasagna, bit of a little pasta, maybe a little steak or something like that, right? The chef makes that for the restaurant owner, who then essentially sells it on to the consumer, right? It's the exact same chain here, right? MM is paying a chef to cook him a gift of mastery. He then takes that gift of mastery and then essentially sells it on for a profit, right? For an increased profit, uh, increased price rather in the form of a legendary weapon and you can see the legendary as the the experience of eating a restaurant right you know like all you know the nice ambiance right maybe a nice glass of wine right a nice chair to sit in right some music going on there and just the whole experience of that restaurant is then being sold by guild mm which is the legendary this is exactly how a a regular transaction or regular business would happen in real life like this is not weird right like whatsoever it's just like i know it might be a little bit too real i know it's a video game guys but that's all that's going on there, right? Like that, you know. The, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, like, it's, 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 like I mean, it's a genuine interest I have. Like I, I've dealt with like I don't know, thousands of players doing this. So like, I mean, you learn things, and then I mean, fun part of it is you could say like, hey, I've I've actually gone through a thousand people that I've I kind of met in some way, even if maybe some of them were like only ten minutes doing all of this. But like, it's whatever. And then also like. Um, a lot of this time, like, the people that, like, I'll buy the stuff from, like, they'll tell me, like, I don't actually even have enough to make the weapon itself. So it's like, if, okay, sell me this Gift of Mastery, use that 500 gold to go buy the Precursor, and then go farm the materials, and then you'll make your weapon. Like, some people will sell you two Gift of Masteries and be like, all right, I have enough to make the third weapon. I mean, I don't want to sell you the third Gift of Mastery. Okay, go make, go make I, the weapon I, yourself. I, I, like, and, and, and basically, like, it's, 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 you're giving someone else capital because most people like always complain uh, that they don't have and so yeah if you give me five, this, uh, this gift of mastery i'll give you 500 gold you'll have maybe enough money to make the next one yourself and if you still don't send me the second one you might have to go do another map completion yeah um, right and then maybe you, the thousand gold that you made off this two gift of masteries if you do another map completion now you can actually maybe make a weapon and then maybe make another or you know through other means uh, at least you'll have your own weapon later in the end so, so from a outside perspective, because I, I've never crafted a legendary for profit. Huh. So when Guild MM is buying a gift of mastery for somebody, what is he actually doing? He's actually paying for the time it took you to yes, make the correct. gift of mastery, the map completion, mm. and the gift of battle. Because that's really the because um the match the match are just gold, right? And so spirit, what spirit he's judge, actually right? paying for is what shot. you can't trade. Yes. And that's time with the spirit shards, that's time with the, the map completion. And the gift uh, and the gift of battle. So a lot of people are all like, "Well, you know, he's just profiting off this." Well, the, the, here's the thing: the the people selling the gift of masteries, they could also say no. Like they'll make more money if they just made the legend themselves. Except maybe they don't have. They can't be bothered to make it, as as yeah. MM said. I've always told people that I thought I think selling gifts of masteries is stupid. Like you should just take that thing and then and then if you were able to make a gift of mastery, you just put a little more time in it. You can make that legendary, and you'll just keep all the profit yourself. Um. 
By the way, you like, could also like the thing is like again, this is why I feel like people go like, um, well, if we don't have enough gold to make weapons or stuff like that. Well, again, like we've mentioned it, like there's gonna be things that you can do in the game if you're gonna heavily invest in trading, that will obviously be the most efficient way to make money in the game, right? It's it's just a just the fact in a lot of MMOs, right? Like you'll make more money like that because that is stuff that reels the best return for a little time, uh, maybe a lot of time early on, but then later it's very little. Um, but in Guild Wars 2, I mean, you could still make a weapon. Like, like if you were, say, to just play the game, no trading, no spreadsheets. If you do your T4s, if you farm a meta maybe once a day or something or twice a day, uh, and let's just say you do that every every day for like a week uh, with the T4s, um, and then maybe do something else. Like, I, I give you two weeks, and if you don't spend any of that, you'll probably make enough to make your weapon. But, you know... Again, you have to put in the work for those two weeks. It's not going to be fun, but you can make whatever that you want to make in that time. It's just you're going to have to sacrifice the two weeks of not playing what you only want to play if that thing doesn't make you money. Like, for example, raiding is a, you know, is a very poor way of making money, right? Like, you don't want to do raiding for money, but if you do your daily T4s and fractals, you do strikes, you do um, like a farming map, like meta. Uh, and I'm not saying like you're going to have to spend three hours in Jizzlewood or three hours farming the living world season four train you could actually just pick and choose the maps uh yeah. maybe not jizzlewood because jizzlewood you need to kind of be there for the entire farm uh but living world season four you can hop in and out of the maps that you want to choose like they basically go through each map so you can go like i'll do istan which is the palawadon and great hall event and then be like okay i don't want to do thunderhead uh oil meta uh maybe i'll do something else and in that time i'll come back and they'll be in Jahai Bluffs doing the, the, the branded shatter, right? I'll, I'll come in for that. Um, like it's you know, pick and choose, but yeah, if you want something, you're gonna put effort in it, maybe two weeks, and then after that two weeks, you're good. Like you can get your weapon, you can get everything, you can get your armor, or like I said earlier, like with strikes, if you want ascended, just go do strikes every day. Like strikes take 40 minutes of your time every day, maybe one hour with wait times and maybe one or two wipes at Whisper or Bone Skinner, but one hour of your time every day. Eventually, after a month, you probably have enough, you know, crystals to get enough of the uh, ascended gear boxes for your six, you know, your six uh, armor armor uh, pieces. So, okay. all yeah, the um, time, but it was worth it. In the end. I, I want to address some, some comments in chat. So we have the Ooh. doctor goes. It's just immoral to make profit off of other people. So here's the thing, though. It's like MM did not force somebody to agree to that deal. Right, there's not he, he's not going there holding a gun in the guy's head and saying like, hey, you're you're going to make this trade with me. Both sides had to have to say yes. Uh, if that person wanted to do it himself, he could have. He just didn't want to, so he chose to sell it. Um, so nobody's forcing anybody to say yes. And it's like I actually find that really weird because like I'll put down sometimes when I'm buying something and then I'll have somebody offer me a price that I don't like, and then they'll and then uh, I'll say no. And I had some people get mad at him because I'm like, I don't, I don't like that price. I'm not going to do the trade. I had one guy, he, um, he offered, or I offered him something for, it was a ledger. I offered him a, a price in Ectos and he agreed to it. And then afterwards he gave me a bad review because I gave him <laughs> a low price. And I'm just like, you didn't have to say yes. <laughs> well, like I, I, I just said, Hey, yeah. I'll, I'll pay this amount. And he's like, okay. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, yeah. That's, the entire thing in all this, guys, is that both people agreed to a trade. Both people benefited. Now, some some people might say that MM benefited more from this, but the guy that sold the Gift Master, he still got 500 gold. He probably thought that that was a good trade for him. He got 500 gold for his efforts. Okay, so it's not that it's immoral. If he if you don't like the offer, you can say no. Like if you're ever doing any kind of uh, off trading game, you're al or off TP trading game, you're allowed to say no. If 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 you go to a job and somebody or you go to an employer and you try to get a job and you don't like the amount that they are offering for your salary, you could say no or ask for more. It's like nothing is forcing you to say yes. So trying to say that Guild MM is immoral because he scammed this guy, it's like that guy didn't have to say yes. Now this isn't a scam. The the like this is also something I want to clarify. Like you can have you can have trades that are lopsided, where you could have trades where one side benefited more than the other. That's just a trade that like somebody just thought that like it was worth it. And maybe if from somebody else, it's like, well, you could have got a lot more for that. And but they both said yes. A scam would be it's just like, 
I will give you 500 gold for your gift mastery. I give you all the stuff. You send me the item, and then I don't give you the 500 gold. I gave you 400 gold. I oh, so your, I, or I just took your stuff. That's a scam, guys. Saying it's, the, it's the hiring people to hire their friends to sell the gift of mastery. The gift of mastery is that's weird. Well, I mean, I still have to explain to the people who are selling me their gift of masteries. I'm I'm gonna send you this, and I'm you know, you're gonna make the weapon for me. You're gonna send it back, and I'll pay you your 500 gold. Yeah, their friend is getting a legendary weapon out of doing it, right? They're gonna get like a weapon if they can sell me 10 successful gift of masteries. But again, each transaction, I'm paying for that transaction. Like well, the friends aren't not getting paid. They're gonna get paid. This friend in particular, right? Because they're referring. That's my think of it like my go-to contact like this friend is going to help me set up the friends that will, are interested in this deal this person sometimes might also take three four materials worth of weapons from me to do it so i may maybe i have other time to do something else well, just real uh, quick or like or explain the deal to them right just, but like just, it's just okay. really not a rip-off like if the friends uh, no, know no, no, what no. they're getting into like I, I mean you know you're gonna get paid this much <laughs> the gift of mastery if you don't think it's worth your time like Okay, but if you do it and then be like, oh, it's not, it wasn't worth my time. You scammed me. It's like, I've explained to you what I was going to pay you. You said yes. Like, that. that's on you to say yes. Like, you could say no. And I'll be like, okay, well, thank you. Like, it's fine. Like, I'll just, find just, somebody else. Let's kind of like br bring this back here. Like, because I know I know people are getting getting a little bit real lifey here. And l listen, guys, okay, you know, like, I, you know, we're, we're not claiming that we're not really talking about morality. We're just explaining how it works. And also, the, do not compare this to real life, guys, okay? Like, if you want to go critique capitalism, right, you, you can go and do that somewhere else, right? But, uh, yeah, uh, you know, like, like, yeah, but, but like, yeah, I mean, dude, look, okay, dude, the chat is woke. And honestly, I love to see it, right? But, uh, you know, like, you know, to, to be very, very clear here, guys, right? It's not like, you know, if you don't work for MM, you like starve to death and can't play Guild Wars 2. Like in real life, yeah, if you don't engage in the system of capitalism, then you literally, you're basically fucked, right? In the video game, you don't actually have to do this, right? You could very easily farm your legendary just by playing the game, right? You know, you could ignore MM and just farm your own thing, or you could just do it yourself. In real life, guys, there's a very heavy barrier to entry, of say setting up your business right you know you need to have it's risky right because you know you're, you're gambling you're you know, potentially gambling your life savings right uh you know it might fail uh you need money to start it right you know there's a lot of time and effort that goes into that in the game guys right you know you can you you know you can like farm quite a lot of money right an hour you're not actually gonna like starve to death if it goes wrong you know if i right now say mm I'm taking you down, bitch. And I start farming up. I'm going to be the biggest baron ever. And I just lose all my gold. I don't die, right? Like, they don't delete my character. So this is why this is not a very good comparison to real life, guys. But, you know, once again, like, this essentially does boil down to the fact that um, players can't be bothered to do the whole thing. MM is making the greatest profit because he's doing the whole process, right? He doesn't just do the gift of mastery. He's also going to source the other materials there as well and craft that as efficiently as possible and then actually sell the thing as well. So he's going through additional steps to do this. But again- I mean, yeah, like, it's, it's, um, not, it's not just I make yeah. the weapons and then list them on the chain. Like, yeah, example, yeah, some there, weapons, I, I, you have to actually plan it. Like you have to know like, how many weapons do I need to trade materials to make more? How many weapons do just, just need to go on the trading post, get gold to get maybe the T5s or something or, or the precursors, because sometimes you can put buyers for the precursors and be cheaper than buying it off another player. So things like that. Um, and also, like someone else mentioned in chat, like, yeah, I actually have the, the like the biggest risk here is because I have to send a thousand five hundred plus gold worth of materials to somebody. That person can just scam me, by the way. Like it's a lot of trust. Even if it's like going through a friend that might I might know or somehow, right? Like I could get scammed. And it's actually happened. Like Compare me and Enko, Enko has never been scammed in the game. I've been scammed about seven times in the game. It's because I don't I trust started. anybody. <laughs> because Enko, for example, post. exactly. Enko only has one counterparty, which is the trading post. He trusts the end game, right? Enko shakes hands with Yvonne Nashblade every second of the game. Example, me, I'm like, you know what? Yvonne, like, I don't want to deal with you all the time, right? I'm going to go somewhere else. But I've been scammed. Like, I've been scammed seven times. Uh, funny enough, they were all from World vs. World players. So that says something. Yeah, so you, you, I've actually seen the comments in here where like someone is just like, "Oh, well, they're keeping a monopoly on the drop rates. Like, why do why are why, like, why are they keeping it so secret? I mean, it took me time and effort, and like I lost gold along the way because to collect drop rates something that wasn't profitable. I'm not gonna I'm not making gold in everything, and so these guys are like, you should just share all this stuff. It's like, 
you guys have the capability of collecting all these drop rates too. Like there's nothing stopping you from going buying these salvageables and then salvaging them and then seeing what comes out of it. So like I shared that spreadsheet on my Discord and a lot of people got it. And then like a lot of people are starting to try this. Like maybe it's hard to do because a lot of people are trying at the same time, but it's like you could, that mindset, that process you could do on everything to try to collect these drop rates. That's that's not something that anybody has, has a monopoly on. It takes your own time and effort to do it. Now, and then to turn around and say, it's like, I want that stuff for free. That's just, that's exactly the same thing as telling uh, nine or a, 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 like a hardcore raid guild. It's like, I want to take up one of your spots and reap the effort and benefits of you having practice raids and doing all this stuff. And I want you to carry me for free just because it, it's unfair that you guys are better than me at the game. There's nothing stopping you from practicing and working on raids and getting better at the game. There's nothing stopping you from collecting this data yourself. So I am fine with sharing these spreadsheets and giving people ideas about it. I will not share the raw data that I took years to collect because like, otherwise, like, why did I do that? <laughs> what was the point if I'm just going to share it freely? So the doctor keeps going, not everyone has access to the knowledge. You do have access to the knowledge though. Nothing secret if you if you buy unsalvageable and you salvage it with the copper fed, you just the reason why you don't have access to knowledge is because you're not taking the time to write down the information. You salvage it, you yeah. write down how many you salvage and how much came I, out of it. That's I, all I'm doing. I want I want to move on from this because it tr trust me. Okay, look, I, I've chatted with the doctor before, Enco, and trust me, this could this could take a while. Okay. Is he just um, a troll? No, no, he's not. He's not a troll, but you know, he's a, he's a, he's an intense lad. He likes to, he likes to get into it, get down to business here. But the thing is, guys, like this is what we actually talked about this last time. Like, how do you get the initial capital? Well, the good news is, is that again, like, there's not. This is what I said last time. There isn't really this barrier to entry. Like, if you wanted to obtain the drop rate, uh, for example, for for uh, an item, you could just do fractals for a few weeks, and then if you wanted to, boom, like you can buy several thousand of this, and you'll go ahead and get like a, you know, like, you know, you'll get a pretty good idea of how that drop rate might operate. What you guys don't see is what Enko is saying here, is that the value of, of uh, you know, the amount of effort that he's put into actually doing this analysis, gathering this data is thousands of hours of essentially playing the game and developing these analysis tools, right, to do this uh, over time. And it is something that you can actually do. They will provide the spreadsheets, right? Like the data is there. And to be honest, there probably are some public resources. I think the wiki actually has drop rate research. Um, for some items, not every item. Yes, I do. Um, but uh, but there is also data available out there. You just have to have to look for it. Um, if you if that's what you want, right? Someone was saying now, a uh, lot is of there even a way to make. Sorry, the, someone's asking. You just want to answer a quick question. A lot of uh, is there even a way to make gold in the wilderness world for real now? Enjoy this game mode. Uh, it takes ages to make some decent gold. In it. any advices? Uh, so I will say, uh, use your spirit shards. You could use them to convert T five to T six maps to other people. Also. The simplest way, if you don't want to deal with people, uh, your you know moldy bags, you could maybe open them up, figure out what to do with the materials, fine or something. Maybe just sell them on the trading post. Uh, and then a third way, uh, check the reward tracks and see what reward tracks give you the best uh, drops or materials, and, and you know try and always farm the best reward tracks in the world. Uh, yeah, there's not many ways. As, as a... <laughs> I just wanted to say that. Wait, wait. What's this chat? <laughs> they have a chant option on... Uh, I on... love this option. It's so good. It, it, it's right. literally, a, it's literally a copy pasta yeah. thing. But you don't have to copy pasta it yourself. You could start a copy pasta yeah, and yeah, everybody else yeah. can join it. It's so stupid. Yeah, it's but so it's good. I love really this stuff. <laughs> yeah, I love... <laughs> Alright, so someone mentioned Cornix. Uh, so he's someone oh, that man. does like the fast farming yeah. um, thing. Yeah. So the public data, the reason why I collect my own data is because, you know, I said before, I don't trust people. I don't trust people, other people's data because I don't know how they obtained it. So there are other people out there that like, you know, they'll post their drop rates and then they'll compile it. Like, will I use that sometimes to check my own to see if it, we're along the same track? Sure. Like Sue can post all of his stuff for all the festivals, right? Um, I won't use his data in my spreadsheets. I will put it into a separate spreadsheet just to see how it matches up. Because I do, I have seen some people, they track things in a different way and they don't, and then like, they don't, they don't say how they're doing it. Uh, we're talking about Cornix. Like if you look at his drop rates that he has on fast, some of those are not so like for his unids, his numbers are like way, way off of what I'm doing. Plus the sample size are kind of small. So anyway, the PEU research thing that somebody brought up the other day, they were like, oh, well this thing for this for salvageables, RuneCraft is really, really profitable. Well, I'm like, so I told him, like, oh, yeah, let's go take a look at the raw numbers he's doing. This guy's only salvaged 250 with RuneCrafters. That's why his numbers look so off. 
So you got to know how to read this data too. And the thing is, if any if any of you guys are past ninth grade, none of this is hard. Like I'm not doing anything more advanced math than algebra. Okay, I don't know when you guys took algebra because some people do take it later. But for 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 the California public K through 12 education, we took algebra by ninth grade. Nothing I do is um is actually is actually past algebra. It's all just x plus y equals z, solve for variables type thing, right? So this stuff isn't hard. It just it takes time and it takes effort to do it. And how you record the data, how you do this stuff can be annoying. Like people are like, like people are going like, well, how do you get the capital to start the stuff? I started with salad with 50 gold. Okay. And back then, I mean, we got gold. We, but you were playing since launch, right? Yeah. Yeah. So do you remember, we got gold for every daily we did. And then the ah, monthly, we got like 10. Gold and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. All right. Um, I also did for, I also did dungeons every day with my guild. So it's like, you can, you don't need a lot of capital to start this. It's just that you need to come up with a plan and you need to start this. So when we were talking about this on Thursday, t you were asking like, well, this is a simple question. Why can't you guys just answer the question? Um, if you guys have ever talked to like a financial advisor, they're going to sit down. Like the first time you meet them, they're going to sit down. It's like, well, what are your goals? You know, what kind of investments do you have? Like, you know, they're going to ask all these questions because they need to figure out your situation before they give any advice. That's why it was so hard uh, to, that was, that's why it was so hard to answer your question directly because the answer to that question, what do you do to make a thousand gold quickly? It's going to be different depending on every person. And also doctor, when you say you clarify, you don't think you guys are malicious, go read all of your comments that you were saying before. And you tell me if you think those comments were malicious. So that's what I'm saying. You need to check yourself. if You're going to try to say that stuff. Um, but yeah, so the thing is, is like a lot of this stuff with with this data collection or anything like that, anybody can do it. You just need to take the time to do it. I did like, do you need Microsoft Excel? Because yes, Excel costs money. You like, I use it now. I started doing this with uh, with uh, the Google Sheets, which is free. Anybody can use Google Sheets. We have so many tools now. It's not that hard to get into this. It's said it takes time and effort for you to go in and do it. I I liken this to raids. It takes time and effort to get into raids. The problem is everybody is looking for that get rich quick button. Everybody, just like in raids, everybody's looking for that give me the win button. Just give me the button to hit, slam my forehead against just to win raids. Stuff takes effort, guys. They 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 need you, like you need to put an effort to be able to make stuff. Um, actually, connect side, that is not true. Financial advisors do care because usually their commission is based off how much money you make. If you If you don't make money or do well with their advice, they will no longer need your services so they have reason to want to help you because hmm. it benefits them too like, so you can't just say they're just trying to sell your product you're thinking of insurance sales next that's different okay so yeah uh, that's so, the thing, though. I, I, no, I think I mean, I, financial I, advisors whole purpose is to keep making money off of you so if they give you bad advice you're gonna get you won't I use mean, them anymore yeah well, yeah you won't use okay. them anymore or maybe you won't have enough money to keep paying them, with, so. with, uh, with with the question about like the you know the question I asked that you know was a bit of a meme there with like the fifty gold investment thing. Like the whole point of that question was to what I wanted to to ask and to clarify to the viewers, and I think it's worth talking about now actually, just very very briefly, is like I wanted to have an idea of like at what point does this scale up that it can become very very profitable, like more so than playing the game. Like that was basically it. Because obviously, if you're playing around with say. 50 gold you're probably not really making that much gold per hour even if you like going really hard on it right okay but you know if you have if you're able to actually scale your operation because obviously you know if you're if you're just doing like 50 gold you're, you're playing with like a capital of 50 gold you're not really going to be able to make a lot of transactions there so your, your profit isn't going to be crazy high right you know if you make 10 percent on five on 50 gold that's five gold, right? Uh, but you know, like the, the point of that question was like, at what point does this become like an, you know, better than actually playing the game or like far better than playing the game? Because there are some pretty good farms in Guild Wars too. You know, you can make yourself 50 gold an hour or so by doing stuff like the fractal farm, right? Like doing fractals, tier fours, right? Every day with CMs, it's obviously going to give you some income. That, that was what I was getting at there, right? Rather than like, you know, like, you know, how much you need to kind of like fuel the entire thing, which was basically the question that you guys thought I was asking, I think, like with like doing fractals every single day or like doing all the med and stuff like that which is definitely like important to know i think this is actually very important to note that a lot of uh, a lot of barons will be supplementing their income uh, and supplementing their investments with other things right you know for example enco is a raider right souls there's a lot of fractals right there as well mm does the meta stuff right there uh, to kind of like generate more funds to then use to make more money but yeah that was what i was asking like you know like how big does your okay. operation how big uh, does your operation have to be before you can start like saying yeah this is i am getting rich off this operation here. 
So if you're actually trying to like make gold, so because the thing is, is it, like anybody that's actually trying to make a lot of gold in this game, they're not doing one single thing. Like one of the slides on my spreadsheet says diversify. You shouldn't depend on one item. Like if you're doing just trading, but you want to spread out. But it's like when I was doing all this stuff, like the beginning game, you know, I was doing dungeons every day. Joe. I was playing the game. I was doing dungeons, the TP stuff on the side. Um, like the TP for me is still a side thing. Raids is still my main thing. Um, you know, dungeons, fractals, fractals still make a lot of gold. You could do that on the TP also to get more gold faster. Like take the gold you get from uh, fractals, invest that in the trading post and make gold off the trading post with your proceeds instead of just to pay on the raw gold from fractals. The problem is, is a lot of people just go, it's like, I'm going to do fractals and that's the only way I'm going to get gold. Uh, I'm only going to do farm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything on gold. So I, I put my account up because somebody was asking how, what my account value is. So, um, but that's the thing is if there's not one singular thing like if you're trying to find like hey what's the most profitable easiest thing to do like we, i can answer that question but if you're trying to go with this like what should the average player do to make gold in the game right now the answer to that question is play the game that really is like minus trading like literally you'll make it anywhere in the game like if you want maybe a focus trade like if you don't mind doing something repetitively uh, maybe right now I'd say fractal 42s, right? Because you can gain up to upwards close to 50 gold if you have the, the fractal god rank. But um, yeah, if you don't fancy that stuff, like just whatever you do in the game is going to give you something. Even if it's 17 gold per hour, like sure, that's, that's nowhere near 100, 200 gold. But the 100, 200 gold is like, it's very specifically, you're going to need to do a lot of, uh, you know, work for it, right? Like it's, it's just a lot of setup. You maybe need space. Whatever, but yeah, if you play the game normally, you'll be fine. You, like over time, you'll build something. Maybe not at a quicker pace, but you'll actually enjoy playing the game. Like you're not gonna feel like this is a job or a chore, right? Like you're just gonna play the game, whatever you make. Just you like be wise in what you use your stuff for. Like if you know this is how many materials you get out of this, right? Don't go and just sell it on the trading post because maybe you're like, oh wait, I was I was probably gonna use that for something later on. So. Just be smart with what you have like and a lot of the times i would even i would say it's uh spend on what you need don't spend on what you want right spend on things that will improve your your gameplay your quality of life right spending on what you want is nice but like if you have priorities spend on that stuff first spend on the things like oh i need ascended or i need a legendary armor all right <laughs> save for that first don't buy that shiny skin on the black lion chest just because it's like oh it's so cool right spend on stuff that you need to help you and then later on save up for the stuff that you want uh so actually make make sure you know the difference between wants and needs maybe yeah uh, tifa uh, you, you yeah. say that bailey's to the moon there was a one point in the game that that stuff was one of the biggest flips you could do. Really? It was like a thousand, oh, yeah. was like a thousand percent profit for like a day and <laughs> it's a half. Like, it was like the, me, me and the boys did a bit. Did, did, okay, uh, so uh, let me explain the Bailey because some people are like, what the hell are you talking about, Tifa? Like, I, I, you might even, this might have come up on your radar like a while back because um, like this was when everyone was like, ooh. You know, do you guys remember when there was like constant Reddit posts? Like whenever an item would go up, people would go like, look at this market manipulation, right? There'll be a Reddit post about it. I don't know if you guys remember that. This is when people were really, really suspicious. It was around the time of the stabilizing matrix controversy that got leaked uh, from the partner program. But anyway, like we were like memeing up. I, in fact, it was, I believe it was actually at Sabatha, guys, Wing One. Uh, and we just said, you know what? Okay, everyone's really suspicious on Reddit. We will make a fake Reddit post and massively inflate the price of bay leaves and vials of enchanted water uh, and troll the subreddit. And that's exactly what we did. And it worked, right? Um, because, we, you know, obviously everyone was going crazy, right? Like buying bay leaves on the stream, right? There's, there wasn't a crazy amount of them there. And vials of enchanted water. I think we actually like pumped the price of vials of enchanted water up from like three silver to like half a gold or something ridiculous like that. Uh, and obviously the same with bay leaves. It was honestly, it was, it was very funny. I mean, I, I mean some, some people made money but obviously a lot of people lost money uh for the meme but you know like that's uh that's kind of the context there guys on the uh <laughs> on the bay leaves there um i remember when that yeah, happened yeah <laughs> it's all good fun there as well but uh, i i kind of want to wrap things up i think we've covered all the topics unless there's something else like you know that you guys uh want to bring up there there is one thing that i am very very curious about because one thing that i think we should all take away here is that a lot of where profit is created is like ultra ultra high volume um to the point where like you you might be buying like forty thousand mithril or like forty thousand like unidentified items like how how do you actually do that like how do you buy 
<laughs> how do you buy 40,000 items um, in one sitting or maybe even more than that, right? Like, because that, you know, the, the, the trading bows is not exactly fast. How do you do that without going insane? Um, Anet has, so in their macro policy, they have stated what macros are allowed. Um, they have said anything for inventory management is allowed. They said like auto clickers are allowed. The only thing you can't do is things that will automate gameplay. Like, oh, this will, I hit this button and it plays my rotation for me, right? That's the stuff that they don't allow, they don't want you to do. They don't want you to automate gameplay. But stuff as far as inventory is fine. So um, a lot of people use auto clickers. Like this is before we had open all. A lot of us use auto clickers to like, we want to open a stack of bags really quickly. Like you just had um, most mice, uh, most gaming mice software has this. You can actually just download software that does this too. Or if you like hold a button down, it would just spam mouse, left mouse button down, left mouse button up. And then you could change the delays, whatever you want. Um, for the trading post, uh, if you do that on an item, it'll spam buy orders for it, um, but it'll put so many requests in before the, it, it processes it that you'll put in like a buy order for like 10, 15,000 at a time. And then if you just keep doing that, you could get up to 100,000. So um, I'm actually really surprised a lot of people didn't know that just because uh, anybody who's played this game from before we had open all, most of the people I know like used auto clickers like to open bags. So it's like I still use the same auto clicker that I that I use like since the beginning. Well, I guess it's changed now because I, I had a, a razor mouse back then. Now I have a Corsair mouse, but it's the exact same thing. Um, and because it's in has to do with inventory management, like opening bags, like auto clickers were okay. They just don't want you to use a macro that goes like, I'm on the golem or I'm on a raid boss. I start the macro and it plays my rotation for me, and I can just watch it. And like they all say, like stuff like that's okay for like the music macros and stuff like that, dodge jump macros. So if you look at their macro policy, uh, like sure, are there some things that are gray area? Like are mouse movements considered an action? Well, if you're looking at it from a computer science stance, in one aspect, yes. If you're looking at it from a, a Windows event log kind of thing, no. If you're looking at it from a game perspective, it's not too. So it's kind of a gray area on that one. They, I really, I've been wanting Anet to clarify what their macro policy is for that stuff for a long time. I mean, that macro policy it actually is because of me. Like they changed that policy because of me, uh, <laughs> because because I was using I uh, I as Boxer to multi box and like play multiple accounts at the same time. Yeah. And then I got banned, and then oh, I'm like, ooh. your policy does not say this, that this is not allowed. And then they unbanned my accounts, and then a day later, they released their current their current macro policy that it's now one key, an action, you can't use key broadcasters and stuff like that. So um, I would love it if they would clarify exactly like what their stance is on this stuff, but they, they haven't. So I'm like, well, what I'm doing right now is in, is, is, is in line with what their policy says. So if you're talking about buy orders like that, yeah, it's... Buy orders, you just put macros. If you're selling stuff, there's a time limit on how often you can sell things on the training post. If you click quickly, you can list 16 items, like 16 stacks or like 16 individual listings before you get a timeout thing. And then after that, you can list another item on the training post every 10 seconds. Oh, wait, I mean, wait, do, do you use automation for that as well? Or a degree of automation no, to list no, items? No. Well, that's, you do no, that I, manually. I, 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 I no, just click until I get a timer. And then I'm Bam like, click. oh, it's been, it's, uh, then I'll come back a little bit later and then I'll just add, add some more in. Yeah, sure. Okay. But like in terms of like listing buy orders then, I mean, how, you know, for example, if you were doing, if you're doing unidentified items, right? Like how many buy orders would you, would you, would you place? Because obviously that's a pretty cheap item. They sell for like less than the silver, right? So like how much would you, how many buy orders would you place? They're, they're like two silver 30 right now. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Never mind then. Cancel that. Yeah. But like how many, buy, yeah, how many would you go for it? Like what, what's, what's, what does a batch, a batch of items look like? Hundred thousand for me. Whoa, hundred thousand! Goodness me. So yeah, that is uh, that's quite a hefty, uh, you know, pretty decent chunk of an investment there. What? Um, well, uh, so after you've processed an entire batch of items, like how? What percentage profit would you make on a batch of items like that? Uh, it depends on what process you're using. So yeah, that that's one of the questions. It's like it. Yeah, we'll do, uh, you know, you know, like ballpark, right? Yeah, ballpark. Um, right? Not, it doesn't so do precise. I yeah. I've done I've mm -hmm. I've done processing on unids in like right now. I think I've tried nine different methods to process unids to see which is most profitable. So the most profitable what one that I'm doing right now? Uh, let me check what the price is right now. The spreadsheet is on its way, lads. I'm not showing the spreadsheet. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, no leaks. No, th this one has like the specific drop rates of like what's the rate of mithril you get out of each unid, rate of leather. Every it's it's got the rates for every single item that comes out of unid. 
So I, yeah, I don't want to show that. Um, right now, uh, for greens, it's 40%, but that also is a really convoluted method on what I do with it, because that also includes what I do with the stuff that comes out of the unIDs right now. So it's a 40% profit right now, but there's a lot of stuff I have to do with the stuff that comes out of it. Like the Mystic Forging stuff I do on the training post, that's included in that 40%. Refining is included in the 40%. Selling stuff on the training post uh, is included in that 40%. All that stuff's rolled in in that. Um, if you're looking at the process that most people do with unIDs, where you open it and then you salvage the, the, the greens, like the masterworks, and then you just sell the materials, like no, you don't even refine mm -hmm. it. Um, that's only 12% right now, and that's actually below the threshold for me to actually bother doing them. So a lot of people that are doing unIDs, this, this is actually the problem with unIDs. Um, I only do unIDs because I know exactly how much I'm getting out of it to, to, to determine if it's worth my time. So a lot of people that are opening these unIDs right now, they're opening them just because somebody told them it was profitable, but they have no idea how much gold they're making out of it, and they don't know how to actually maximize the profit out of it. So what they end up doing is spending a lot of time doing something that's actually pretty boring. Like I only do this stuff like when I'm watching other streams or I'm watching Netflix or I'm doing other things because it is really boring to just open it. Because yeah. I, I streamed this before when this was a, when Magic Find affected them. I streamed it for like four hours and I was like falling asleep in the middle of the stream. But it's boring. So um, a lot of people are doing this. They're doing a very basic process on it because people just tell them open, salvage, sell. Um, and it's only a 28 copper profit on that item right now. And they're also only doing like 10,000 an hour. Like an idea that's something you need to do in mass. Like um, I, I calculate this based on gold per hour. Mm -hmm. So, and I compare it to other gold per hour. So like Drizzlewood Coast, it, at the, I think that one of the times I looked at it was like 40 gold that people were reporting, 40 gold an hour. So you need to open bags fast enough and be able to process all this stuff fast enough to beat 40 gold an hour. And for the process that most people are doing right now, where they're just salvaging it, uh, they they have to do like twenty uh, I think it's eighteen thousand an hour right now, match Drizzlewood Coast and Drizzlewood Coast. I hate farming. Drizzlewood Coast is more interesting than doing unIDs. This is that that was the core of my question that I asked that was that caused a bit of confusion, right? It's like you know how much you have to do to actually be better. It's than a farming, lot of work, right? Yeah, it's a lot. A, it's a yeah. lot. Like uh, yeah, this is why it's, it's boring for most people because for sure. I mean, you have to be but into the, this yeah. stuff and kind of like do it like when you're maybe gonna do something else. Like you're gonna I don't know. Uh, do the unidentified gears, but then have like maybe a side tablet or second screen and just put up something to watch while you're doing it. Because uh, it's not fun. Like it's just literally open, uh, salvage, oh, sorry, extract and, you know, salvage if you have to salvage and then figure out what you have to do. Like then you like imagine like after opening all of them, you have to then literally organize them in the bank, literally organize all the materials you get, all the uh exotics or whatever you have to organize all that in the bank then you have to go refine that stuff then like it's you're not gonna have fun like and i, I know most people <laughs> probably will they'll just yeah. stop like no, literally agree, yeah. like once they're done like salvaging everything they'll just be like you know what i'm gonna refine this like tomorrow or after tomorrow and yeah, they're gonna be so burnt out yeah for yeah. sure like, and this is not something that you do as like this is how i'm gonna make gold like if you're gonna do on ids like um Anything that requires processing, so this this is a this is something that requires heavily heavy processing. This is probably the the most process intensive thing. So that forty percent. Um, so like on the spreadsheet earlier, I was showing like the different how I think about this in different layers. Like you you have the item at level zero, and then you could do three things to it, like either sell the trading post, sell to other people, or process it. And then every layer, there's another process option. So that forty percent for me is representing nine levels of processing. Okay, it's not just open, salvage, sell. It's open, salvage, refine, craft into other things, turn into other things, turn into other things, turn into other things, turn into other things, and then I eventually get to that forty percent. So the the method that like Cornix is showing on his stream a lot, where he's just opening and salvaging them, um, that process right now. That's why his numbers seem really far off. Like I don't know why the pro the profit on that right now is twelve point three percent. I've always had a fifteen percent threshold for anything I do. Um, 12% for doing something so boring and to actually beat a farm, which is more interesting, you have to open a lot per hour. And most of the people that come to me asking for help on this, um, they're only opening like five to 10 K an hour. And it's, it's, you're better off just doing drills of wood. Like you'll still end up with materials, but you're not sitting there just opening bags. But if you're also going to do this, like you should set up a spreadsheet to track your profit. So you know when you should stop buying these things, because if NADs go up 30 copper, 
for most people, they won't be profitable anymore, but because people don't track this stuff, they don't know when to stop. They don't know when to stop, and then they're going to open these, and then they're going to spend all this time and effort, and they're going to actually lose gold. So if you're doing anything with processing, that's like the, the spreadsheet I shared with like the salvage rules. Um, that kind of stuff, it's not just it's like, buy these 10 items, they'll salvage it, and you'll make gold. It's at that time, you, you could buy those and salvage them and make gold. But you also want to know tomorrow, are these still good to buy? So this kind of stuff, I, if you're going to get into it, like I'm saying, like someone's saying it's like, oh, MM's trying to talk people out of it. No, like this stuff is super profitable. Unnamed is super, super profitable, but it takes a lot of work. And if you're just doing it because someone told you to do it, I really, really recommend you set up a way, get, set up your own process that you can track your drop rates. Like after you open them and salvage them, write down the materials that come out of it, write down how many you opened, write down like the salvage costs, like from the copper fed and all that kind of stuff. Work out the numbers so you can actually figure out what profit you're making so that you know if, hey, if unnamed go up to 235, to 240, to 245, to 250, if mithril goes down to 80 copper, if silk goes down to 50 copper, whatever, all the different price fluctuations that'll happen because right now, uh, when you're processing unnamed, you get um, 16 different items. All those will affect the profit from this stuff. If you're not tracking how the drop rates and the, the prices for those materials are doing this, you may eventually do this when it's no longer profitable. So, but, and, and every single person I've talked about this, they're just like, well, I mean, like when I did this last week, it was fine, but they're not tracking it on like whenever they process these, whenever they put borrowers in, and like they actually don't know if they're actually making gold. So that's the problem with this. It, it requires, um, it requires, a way to track this stuff and um there are very few people in the game that go into spreadsheets like the way i do um i know there's a, like you could do this a lot better way like teapot you're like you are a developer you could probably write something that would do this like there is i will say that there is an add-on that i i know some people use that uh uh records data from the game and it'll Ooh. it'll just track you like a live drop rate tracker um i don't do that because i i just use silver's csv to like account to csv tool so you can do this but the problem is is again most people don't track their stuff like the stuff i do again it's very hard for people to replicate because most people won't put the time and effort into track their profits like i tracked it down to the tenth of a copper for profit because my sample size is that big that i know so if an unads go up by one copper or like mithril goes down by like five copper, I can see how that changes the ratios of all the profits and, and can make the determination if I should keep doing this or not. Most people won't do that though. So that's mm. that's kind of the problem with unids is that um, a lot of people are doing this being like being uninformed and they don't understand that there's a lot of things that can affect this. So like there was a point in time, uh, I think six weeks ago, unnamed were actually a loss. They were actually like a like an 8% loss. And people were still buying them. And people were still trying to process them. And they didn't know that they were just flat out throwing away gold because they don't track this stuff. So the stuff that I do requires a lot of like drop rate research. So it, it does require a lot of ramp up time. You know, there, there was a period when I was starting to do this, I did lose a lot of gold. Um, and then once I figured out like the different processes, then there were, cause like I, I said, I did nine different processes to try to figure out how to do this stuff. Uh, four of them right now are actually just a loss. One of them was the thing that you do teapot where you salvage the IDs directly. Um, that's yeah. why I know that's such a huge loss. Cause I actually tested that and I actually tested to see what the, the loss in uh, like what the returns were. So most people won't do this stuff. And like, is this hard? It's not hard. It's just time consuming. It's time consuming to gather that information. Like, Think how long it takes to open 68.2 million bags. Oh, oh. And that, that's my current data set. The, those other eight data sets, they all have about two to three million each of them in there. So it's it's honestly closer to like 80,000 that I've opened and I have tracked those rates. Uh, most people won't do that. And honestly, yeah, do you need that big of a size I'm, for this? Just by the way, like it guys, even if a reading net did make the drop rates public, like most people aren't going to crunch those numbers. You've got to do so much more number crunching than just the drop rates, guys, to actually compute like the way this is, because this is like a multi-layered process. But yeah, like this is. I think like the the real takeaway here is it's an incredibly data-driven process, uh, and it's yeah. not it's not simple, and it also is going to take a lot of a lot of uh, kind of legwork to actually get done when you're dealing with these massive massive volumes. 
um, yeah, and as well. how how has this benefited me other than Guild Wars 2? The stuff I learned in developing these spreadsheets, like the different formulas, the different functions that Excel has, because I, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not certified in Excel. I don't, I never took a formal course. This is all like, oh, how do I do that? Oh, let me go to Google Excel. How do I make a, how do I make a table? All right, I just did that for everything. Um, I've used a lot of the skills in my, like, so I'm in the Navy. I'm a reservist now. I was after duty, and then I was a government contract for a while. A lot of the stuff I did for that stuff was I actually did use a lot of the Excel skills I learned from that, and it cut my workload from like 40 hours a week down to like five hours a week because of the nature of the job I do because I was in cybersecurity. So I, I set up filters on Excel. I just had a load of data set into it, and it just did most of my work for me. So has this had like real life benefits in like doing this? Yes. And honestly, I, I like playing with spreadsheets. I like, and it's like a big puzzle to me. And ultimately that's that's the thing. If you want to get into this stuff, because you have to enjoy it to an extent. Otherwise you're just going to burn out and, and not do yeah. it. Right, you know, like yeah. I, I was, you know, like I said, you know, I, I did to an extent engage in this. I was doing the heavy moldy bags. So I was like, oh God, <laughs> I just want to play the game, man. Like, you know, I, at some point I was like, no, I don't really want to do it anymore. Even though it was making me like a ridiculous, I mean, I, I think at the time it was insane because I wasn't a very hardcore player back then, but with heavy moldy bags, I got, I was able, I was doing it so much and doing it like constantly, like, you know, all day, honestly, I was, I was like literally just like opening these stupid bags. It was to the point where I got a legendary in like a few days, right? Just by doing this like over and over again. Way? I would like to know. Oh my God. Did you actually track of that? I don't know. I didn't track it. I didn't track the data, but it must've been, it, honestly, it was it was pro it was it was it was six figures i think yeah it was like over 100k i think it was like okay. a lot like a lot a lot um 37 uh, of million banks. tracked yeah Ooh, oh, okay yeah i mean i don't think i did that many okay but it was like it was a lot i i made thousands and thousands of gold uh by doing it at the time uh but you know i didn't i didn't do it for that long i just got incinerated i was like no i'm done right after that i rage quit like, that is it i'm going back to afk now okay much more <laughs> <laughs> much more fun go by the fk but uh you know anyway um I, well i hope you guys i hope that guys give you guys a little bit of scope on the entire thing but chat uh if you guys have got any burning questions you want to ask we can have a brief questions period or if mm or Enka, if you guys have any final words uh here like to wrap things up or things that you don't think we covered or you want to actually like directly mention there that would be great but let's see if the chat has any, uh, no, you can't just say, how do I make 69 gold? If they've got any unanswered questions, those little, little details, little, uh, little tips that you guys might want, because otherwise we will start to wrap things up a little bit here. We've been going for a while. I think we've had a fantastic conversation here, uh, but I think that will just about be all of that, guys. Is M, oh, good. See, guys, these are, this is what I'm talking about, okay? Well, what's going on there, right? What even is this stuff? Like, sugar daddy stuff there? Tax returns, right? Okay, here's an interesting thing. Okay, here's a good one, actually. Okay, um, what are some common mistakes people make when they're trying to farm gold or make uh, make gold? Some of the mistakes that people make when they farm or make gold, spend it on things that they want rather than things that they need. And like Enko said, trying to make gold by like not knowing why this method makes you gold. So understanding the method and exactly how it works is key oh here we go we now have people people are lazy yeah true actually very true uh i have personal experience with that because i am lazy right me play game me buy right now there you go you can so, you even got a powerpoint there on how it all works there as well uh, uh these are good habits to do in the trading post uh people that don't follow these are throwing wiggle boom there you go my friends there you go uh, what kind of things uh, you need with gold? Uh, I mean, ascended armor, uh, ascended weapons, uh, having maybe enough gold to buy upgrades in case your meta changes. Things that affect your gameplay is, I would say, things that you need. Anything that affects the way you play the game is something that you might require. Things that you just enjoy and want would be things that just make you look pretty, which is fashionable. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And... Um... In uh, actually, look, here's a really interesting one. Actually, how long did it take you guys to start making big? You know, like how many, like you know, uh, like weeks, months, whatever, before you guys started making like big bucks? Like before it started becoming very profitable. Like how long was that kind of trial and error, figuring it out, learning the the ins and outs of the mechanics of it all, and understanding the system? How long did that take? Um, what do you mean by I'd big say... bucks? Define define that, please. Oh, I mean, sure. Before you start, before you started 
uh, making thousands and thousands, right? Let's just let's just say that. Like before you started making like thousands of gold on you know like uh, on the regular, right? Like being able to just buy whatever you want, essentially. I would say maybe oh buy everything you want. Uh, I said before I was uh, before. For you are a I rich player. You are probably rich. I was rich really, player. I would say, rich enough to say, like, yeah, I could spend whatever and I won't worry about it. Maybe yeah. about close to three years. Around 2015. So um, before that, like, uh, I'm pretty sure there were people who were already at the 80k, 90k, 1000 gold mark, even 100k rank. Uh, uh, and I think me around 2015, I had just been around there, like 60k, right? Um, so I would say, yeah, about and a half three years before i actually got to the level where i was comfortable to buy whatever i want and not worry about having to make the gold back uh my raw gold didn't go over 5k until path of fires came out because i had goals so like whatever because uh one of my goals was to buy all the wardrobe skins that you could buy with gold so the most expensive one was like one of the fuse great swords and stuff like that um and those were around 5k so whenever I got 5k, I would just put a buy order for stuff. So I didn't really get, I didn't really have a lot of liquid or raw gold until Path of Fire came out when I ran out of skins to buy. And then that's when my liquid gold like shot up to 400,000, which I hate. I, I'd rather keep my liquid gold like under 10,000. Mm. After a certain amount of wealth and you're able to buy everything, well, what's the incentive there to keep building gold? Uh, so for me, I mean, I just, it's mostly I've had an interest to be somewhat of a, trader like in runescape i was doing that um in my incentive was always like i wanted to have enough to do whatever i wanted with like anything that i can do with gold or buy anything in the game i always wanted that to be like something that i would always make sure i can take care of so i did that in runescape uh, guild wars one uh to some extent i don't think i was that rich in guild wars one there was a richer players than i was in guild wars one um world of warcraft so any game that i played was, was just always an interest that i keep having enough to do whatever I want without having to worry about, oh, I got to go spend or save up this much before I could do what I want. So if I, if I can buy it quickly, uh, then that was my goal to make sure I can always get whenever I want uh, anytime. Uh, in Guild Wars 2, it's turned into more than that because I played Guild Wars 2 when I was, in, I guess, high school. And then now I'm like, I've graduated out of college, I'm working. So over time, it became like, uh, yeah, enough to make whatever I want in the game. Then slowly, I want to, you know, possibly when it was a reality become uh, the richest player and then and eventually turned into like uh, I actually want to build a trading network and, and how far can you extend like this boundary of having an intricate net, net, you know network of players trading together um, communicating and then using the guild bank on a daily basis uh, all that stuff like the, the whole trading community really became the incentive uh, and now it's just kind of same uh but also focusing on stream so you need gold to fund these big giveaways right so i use that as well to kind of give my streams an edge because i can right and same with uh, anko to maybe one extent uh, what's your account value on old school runescape uh well, i guess from 2000 what was it five to maybe seven or eight uh maybe not that much maybe it was only like uh two three billion but it was shared with maybe a few of my friends in dubai so uh I guess it's not that oh. much when you split it against like four or five people, right? So, so uh, obviously golden, golden RuneScape not worth quite as much as Guild Wars Two gold. A billion yeah, gold so. in this game that would be uh, that would be quite something, I think. Uh, <laughs> in, in the oh. very old RuneScape, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, uh, of course, of course. A slight extension to the answer too, though. So, when did everything settle out where the process was just kind of flowing? Um, that was like four weeks after the game started. So all the spreadsheet stuff, like the the start of all this, that that was like in place, probably like within a month of the game starting, because mm -hmm. I did a lot of the stuff in Guild Wars Two or at Guild Wars One. So, so there was already that, exp that the the knowledge was already there, right? Or the methodology was already understood. Yeah, the um, the, the mindset, yeah. the process mindset, um, was already there. Okay, all right. I actually do this on a bigger scale in Guild Wars One in some cases. Actually, oh wow! So. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay, actually, let's let's do let's do one more here then, uh, and we can kind of wrap things up here. Uh, how much time into a new expansion or like a new thing or a new release in the game uh, do the barons wait to act? Like before before they do they wait for the economy to settle or not, right? Or do you just kind of leap right in there and just like do some do some like YOLO speculation? Or at what point or how long 
does some really a content release have to be out or some kind of new resource or new economy to deal with uh, before you'll start to actually kind of dig into it? Will you just start immediately analyzing it or is there some period of time that you'll kind of wait uh, to see how things actually pan out? Um, as soon as we see any patch notes or stuff like that. So I don't do a lot of speculation stuff. Dan does a lot of that and he's been right like 99% of the time. Like he made like 600,000 gold off of uh, Snowfall runes, for instance. Um, the... So the thing is, like, as soon as a patch goes live or we have the patch notes, you can always start taking action. So, like, an example is, like, when Black Lion chests get updated um, and they have the, um, you know, the new, the new where they, they rotate out the weapon sets. If you open Black Lion chests as soon as you can after the patch, that's one of the few times you should instant sell them because you want to catch the people before they cancel their buy orders. Because um, otherwise, the price is, like, crash down to 20 gold. But for, like, an expansion... Um, Play through it as soon as you can, and as soon as you see like new vendors, uh, and you see like, oh, this will have this vendor has stuff, or like that you could craft this item that people are going to want to do this. You could take a look at those recipes, like what what's needed for those, and just start buying those up. Because once everybody else hits that content, then um, then the prices on those will go up. So it does behoove you to get through content as fast as possible. Like the first playthrough I do when a new patch comes out, like a new like story patch or um, like new a new expansion i actually i don't pay attention to the story at all i go through it skip everything and just try to get rush it as fast as possible and i just ignore everything that's happening i just want to get to the vendors and see what <laughs> what you can craft what you can do and then once that's done and we process that stuff uh then after that i'll play it again on a different character and then i'm like okay now i'll sit here watch all the cutscenes. i'll pay attention to the story i'll laugh i'll cry i'll do whatever it is but that does not happen on the first playthrough oh the first it's all playthrough, about the money you, you're trying to get access to everything first yeah so that you can then see it's like is this going to affect markets in any way all right sounds like pain i mean yeah but you want to get rich well that's the point it doesn't sound yeah. painful to get rich to yeah. be honest. i know you got to go through a little bit of pain but then boom you can get whatever you want in the game and that allows you to you know you can suffer a little bit now and then you have access to whatever you want later on so it kind of enables um it, it allows you to have a lot more freedom within the game like that's what this to an extent that's what making gold is about guys in Wars. it's about quality of life and being able to enjoy the game instead of having to you know put hours in the game to enjoy the game right there's no waiting to have fun if you have a lot of gold because you can say right i want that i've got it now i can actually enjoy that instead of having to like grind 100 hours to get there uh but i think that will just about wrap things up here for the show uh, let's do some brief introductions here. Uh, let's go ahead and go there from the top. Guild MM, give us a few kind of closing thoughts, perhaps, on the whole topic at hand here today. And of course, tell us about yourself and what you're up to in Guild Wars 2. Yeah, so uh, before I get into what I'm up to, uh, if you want to learn any of this uh, money-making stuff, uh, jump into my stream, jump into Enko's stream, Sam's stream, Souls stream, and then just ask your questions there. If you have more questions you want to ask, just ask there. Uh, remember, like, liquid gold is, is sure. Like, you might need it to get a lot of things you want in the game. But keep in mind, if you already have a high value account value, if your account is worth 100, 200, 300k, 400k, 500k, it's you, you're worth something, right? So make sure uh, that you don't just play this game to make money just because other people make fun out of it, right? So, or enjoy it. So, Play what you want to play and enjoy it and uh that's it really if you play the game and you don't like trading you'll still make enough money uh what i'm up to uh well i'm about to host the largest most ambitious guild versus guild tournament uh coming to you first at uh may 31st right the ultimate showdown the revival of guild versus guild guys is coming if you want to donate to any of the prize pool we're already at 130,000 gold Ooh. donate to guild mm guild space mm.4269 uh, i have the best numbers in the game 4269 <laughs> to donate to mighty space teapot uh, dot uh something there is no uh, space actually <laughs> there's no space ah I did not know. <laughs> anyway you can donate to me mighty teapot or roy the biggest most ambitious tournament Let's all right go. get in on that go tweet and, and go tweet what are my tweet is it and uh, go to you know uh, teapot's uh, twitter and tweet whatever his tweet is at uh and get involved in the gvg discord all right champions of the mist is going to become a yearly event guys all right um and of course thanks to Ana coming in with the clutch with the new arena changes so uh it's gonna be exciting it'll be fun come watch the best guilds compete for bragging rights and uh a lot of gold oh so, yes indeed we love to see that 
And here we go. The man with the spreadsheets. The man with the PowerPoints. Enko, do you have any uh, final things to mention? And of course, let us know what you're up to here, because of course you are also a Guild Wars 2 streamer. And I put this one in a big guild indeed, and with Deax and some of the other NA sweaty boys too. So tell us all about that. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to learn more about this stuff, um, I generally am pretty open about answering questions. The only thing I don't give out is my raw data, but the process and everything like that, like if people ask questions, I'm pretty open to doing this. It's the same mentality with raids. It's the same mentality with the with making gold in the game. It takes time, takes effort. You, know, you there's no there's no get rich quick thing in here, as long as you're staying within the bounds of the game because of certain issues I've had. But um, anyways, but I'm actually getting deployed here soon. So my first day of reporting in, I'm actually officially back on active duty now. I'm going to be checking in for processing to get shipped out on Monday. Um, and then I should still be local until June 10th or 11th. So I'll probably still be streaming for a couple more weeks, but uh, not really sure how that's gonna go. Uh, if you wanna keep in touch with me, you can join my Discord. Uh, I guess I'll post the link for it in chat if you wanna do it. Um, but yeah, so that's happening soon. Um, as far as with Win, I actually haven't played with them in a month and a half because they're all practicing for the HRP. Uh, of and course, yes. I'm gonna be deployed. I, uh, you know, I, I won't be around for it. So, um, yeah, I haven't really got to play with them. So I've been doing a lot of pugs. I've been doing a lot more gold making stuff on stream. Um, but yeah, should still be streaming a bit, as I said. But uh, yeah, I will be out of con. Well, I won't be out of content because I will have internet where I'm going in my room. It's just very expensive. It's $300 a month for oh. a 10 meg line. Oh, no. <laughs> Oh, and, dear. Uh, I'm not sure how stable this. I'm not sure if I'll be able to play the game or not. I definitely can't stream. I should be able to watch streams. But um, but yeah, I won't be back until like April 2022. So. Oh, wow. Goodness me. So a bit of a hiatus there. Uh, but of course, as you say, there's still plenty of ways to keep in touch uh, there with Enko. So be sure to check that out. And then finally, I guess I better say a few words because our uh, massive Thanks uh, to the Barons here, MM and Enko. Thank you guys for coming on the show. I really appreciate that. And I think the community really does too. Like gold making and understanding how the game works. I think it is a really interesting topic to talk about. And it is something that I would love to actually make uh, a lot, you know, you know, to really be like a more of a public issue, more of a well-known and understood thing because there is a lot of misinformation. There is a lot of misunderstandings about how the game actually works, what it means to be a Baron, all that stuff. So I really appreciate you guys coming on there and just being trans transparent right and really sharing this knowledge these are all really powerful tools guys that you can apply right you don't have to be doing this all the time to be squeezing a little bit extra value out of your playtime right this is all about getting the most out of your hours right that you have in the game uh, with whatever you're doing in real life so massive shout out to those guys and definitely check out their content as often as you can of course you can also follow this stream as well. Okay, I'll try and get some more tea times going about the place. There's some interesting topics uh, to discuss here about Guild Wars 2 and everything involving that. And, uh, you know, I think I definitely want to mention all the tournaments of I'm, of course, involved with the GBG tournament coming up. In fact, after this, guys, after this tea time, I'm going to go and spectate a GBG that our very own Roy is playing in on the EU server. So stay tuned for that there. If you're on the stream YouTube, you guys can't see that. So unlucky, okay? But you know what? Still pretty cool stuff there and uh i am also going to be running a lot of events there as well if you want to get involved uh, and all that stuff guys join the hard suck discord join the hard suck community to learn about everything guys you can learn about money from the barons but you can learn about everything else from hard suck so hit that xmish mark discord in the chat there get involved there at discord.gg forward slash hard suck to get involved in the biggest and most epic guild wars 2 community there is but that about wraps things up here from us for the tea time. Thank you guys so much all for watching. Hope you enjoyed the stream. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, Twitter, Twitch, YouTube. Links will be below on YouTube. Links are below now on the stream there as well. Just get in there and check things out. But yes, that about wraps things up here on our end. So thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for coming on the show uh, over there. And well, I'm going to keep streaming. But okay, for all the YouTube people out there, right, we're out of here, right? See you guys later, okay? Uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the tea time. Good stuff, guys.